What's cracking, everyone? Hello and welcome to MPL Weekly. I'm Alias V and I'm going to be taking you through the deck list you're going to see in action in the Ruby Division. Starting things off, we've got Autumn Burchett's Golos Fires list. Now, while it may look like your typical Golos Field of the Dead deck, it's not because it's playing a rather cool card combination in Fires of Invention and Fae of Wishes, but we'll get to that very, very soon. First things first, let's take a look at Golos and what Golos wants to do. So if you haven't played any magic in the last little while, you will have missed all of the zombie shenanigans that Golos and friends like to get up to. What this deck aims to do is ramp as quick as it can, getting as many lands out of the deck as possible, and then capitalizing on all those different lands with Field of the Dead, which says every time a land enters the battlefield, or if Field of the Dead enters the battlefield, you create a 2-2 zombie, but you need seven unique lands to be able to do that. So the deck runs several cards that help you ramp. You've got Growth Spiral that lets you draw a card and put another land onto the battlefield. You've got Circuitous Root that lets you find a guild gate or a basic land, brings them onto the battlefield tapped. You've even got Beanstalk Giant's Fertile Footsteps that allows you to find a basic land card from your library, put it onto the battlefield, and then shuffle it up. The key land finder in all of this though is Golos Tireless Pilgrim himself. He allows you to find a land, most of the time it's going to be Field of the Dead, and he's also got a really really cool activated ability that allows you to exile the top three cards of your library and play them this turn without paying their mana cost. So Golos is a key key card in this entire deck. He goes and finds Field of the Dead and he helps you create as many zombies as you can just to overwhelm your opponent and win the game with your horde. So while the deck wants to get all the ramp, all the land, all the other things out, it also wants to make sure that you, the player, stays alive. And it's got several cards in the deck to help you do that. We've got Deafening Clarion just to, you know, wipe the board, keep control of it, make sure no little aggro creatures are getting in for that damage. Time Wipe as well, which is a pretty nifty card because it returns a creature you control to your hand as well and then destroys all creatures. Most of the time that card is going to be Golos because then you can find another Field of the Dead and then just, you know, bring your army back to life. Another cheeky spell that helps you just maintain some control of the battlefield is Agent of Treachery that steals absolutely anything and keeps it on your side of the battlefield. Now let's take a look at what makes this deck unique compared to the other Golos decks. And that card is Fires of Invention. Now Fires of Invention is a really sweet enchantment that says you can cast spells only during your turn and you can cast no more than two spells each turn. Why though? Well, because you can cast spells with converted mana cost less than or equal to the number of lands you control without paying their mana cost. So you can see how this works with all the ramp in the deck, because you get out all these lands, you slap Fires of Invention down, you can follow that up with an extremely powerful spell, and then every turn thereafter you get to play two extremely powerful spells for free. Speaking of powerful cards, one of the most powerful cards in the deck is Kenrith, the Returned King. For 5 mana, which is free if you have Fires of Invention down, you can plonk him on the battlefield and you can activate his abilities with the mana that you haven't used yet because Fires of Invention has paid for that spell in essence. The main ability that Kenrith likes to utilize is the first one that says all creatures gain trample and haste until end of turn. So you can imagine, you amass an army, you play your lands for turn, you play Circuitous Root, you slap Kenrith on the battlefield, you push the red button, and then you all swing in together in a glorious flurry of damage. Yes, that is why you play Kenrith the Return King in a Golos Field deck. But the main reason to play this iteration of Golos Field is, of course, Bay of Wishes. Not only is this a really effective blocker for two mana if you really, really need it, but take a look at the adventure side of the card. Granted says you may choose a non-creature card you own from outside the game, reveal it, and put it into your hand. That is, of course, referring to your sideboard. So, you've got Fires of Invention down, you play Granted, and you go fishing for any one of these cards. Barring, of course, the Agent of Treachery, because that's not a non-creature spell, but that's besides the point. Let's take a look at the sideboard. You have so many removal spells. You've got Devout Decree, you've got Prison Realm, you've got Time Wipe, you've got Enter the God Eternals, you've got Planar Cleansing, Casualties of War. If you need to kill anything, the sideboard's got you covered. You've got access to Planeswalkers like Teferi Time Raveler and Nicol Bolas Dragon God. You have ways to find your key creatures with shared summons. If you need to find Golos or Kenrith or a Hydroid Crisis, then that's the way to do it. You've got an alternate win condition in Chance for Glory if you feel like you need just one extra turn to get your zombie horde through. That's gonna do it for you. And then finally, we've got Plain Wide Celebration that allows you to choose four things. You can either create a 2-2 citizen token, return target permanent from your graveyard to your hand. So if Golos dies, you can bring him back. You can proliferate or you can gain four life. 
So those are the extremely powerful cards on the sideboard that Fae Wishes lets you find. This is what sets this deck apart from any of the other Golos field decks we've seen, and as Field of the Dead is banned, this will be its final outing, so F to pay respects for Field of the Dead. One of the most dominant decks this week in the hands of one of the most dominant players, reigning world champion Javier Dominguez and Mythic Championship 5 winner, has brought Bant Food to the table. Javier Dominguez and Huey Jensen are both playing Bant Food decks, so let's take a look and see what makes this deck just so powerful. Kicking things off, we've got Gilded Goose that enters the battlefield and creates a food token. Now you can sacrifice that food token and add one mana of any color. So that allows you to get your Planeswalkers down a turn early. So turn two Oko, pretty good. We've also got the Arboreal Graze that allows you to play another land onto the battlefield. He helps you ramp up a little bit, but you know, he's not as cool as the Goose. In the two mana slot, we've got Paradise Druid that helps you ramp. We've got Disdainful Stroke to counter any CMC4 or greater card. Three copies of Once Upon a Time, that's almost a staple in every single green deck now. It allows you to find a land if you're missing a particular color, or find a creature that you may need to get a specific job done. Maybe a Questing Beast, maybe a Wicked Wolf, maybe a Big Fat Jellyfish Hydroid Crisis. Speaking of which, here he is, but he is not a 2CMC creature, so we're going to move him down over here, because you want to put as much mana into this little fishy as you can. Taking a look at the 3CMC slots, we've got Deputy of Detention. Now, this, you'll see, is the only white splash in the deck. This is the reason to play Bant, as opposed to just straight Simic. Deputy of Detention is great removal for any non-land permanents and opponent controls, especially those pesky zombies that were running around recently. It gets rid of absolutely all of them, they don't come back because they're tokens, they just go into the ether, and then Deputy Detention is just left hanging out on the battlefield. When it's not going after zombies, it can just exile any non-land permanents and opponent controls. Oko, Thief of Crowns. The reason that Simic and Bant are so popular at the moment is this guy. So, Oko, for loyalty, plus two, create a food token. Now, we've already seen that food tokens can be used by the Gilded Goose. There's more food synergy, though, with the Wicked Wolf, which we'll get to in just a second. For plus one, Oko can turn target artifact or creature into a 3-3 three, three green elk. So that food token you just made, that can now be a 3-3 three, three creature that's attacking and blocking for you. And then for minus five, Oko can exchange control of a target artifact or creature you control with a target creature and opponent controls with power three or less. So if there's something on the battlefield that you'd like to have, that food token you just made, you can do a little switcheroo there with your opponent's stuff. Moving on to the four CMC slots, we've got Questing Beast. Now this card certainly lives up to his name. It's got Vigilance, Death Touch, Haste. It's a 4-4 four, four, and it really doesn't like Planeswalkers because every time it deals damage to a player, it deals the same amount of damage to a Planeswalker. The Questing Beast is also particularly good against a horde of zombies because, as you can see, it can't be blocked by creatures with power 2 or less. Moving on to the Wicked Wolf, which is a great piece of removal because when Wicked Wolf enters the battlefield, it fights up to one target creature you don't control. But Wicked Wolf is also a really good payoff card for all the food that you've been generating in this deck because it has the ability that says Sacrifice a food, put a 1-1 counter on it, it gains indestructible until end of turn. So, for example, if there's a 4-4 four, four you'd want to kill, Wicked Wolf enters the battlefield, Target that creature. Before damage is dealt, you click on the wolf, activate its ability, sacrifice the food, it gets the 1-1 token, becomes indestructible, and kills the creature while your wolf survives. So, a great removal spell, and a very sticky threat to boot. And to finish things off, we've got Nissa who shakes the world. She brings your lands to life, making them hasty 3-3s, three and also allows you to ramp, because every time you tap a forest for mana, you get an additional green mana. Where's a good place to put all that mana? Well, a Hydroid Crisis, of course, because with Nissa on the battlefield, this is a massive threat in the air, which also draws you a bunch of cards and gains you a bunch of life. Let's take a look at Javier's sideboard, starting things off with Veil of Summers. So this is great against the blue and black matchups. It allows you to draw a card and gives everything hexproof until end of turn, and any spells you control can't be countered. We got two copies of Glass Casket, which allows you to exile target creature with CMC 3 or less, so very good against specific matchups, particularly the aggressive ones. Then we got Aether Gust for the red and green matchups. Three extra copies of Disdainful Stroke to counter any of those pesky CMC 4 or greater spells. One copy of Negate for non creature spells. Prison Realm is extra removal for planeswalkers and creatures. One copy of Knight of Autumn as a utility card, you can either put counters on it, you can destroy a target artifact or enchantment, or gain 4 life as needs be. Got an extra copy of Questing Beast if you need a little extra questing action in there. You've got Voracious Hydra 2 if you need a little bit of extra removal or just a very, very big thing on the battlefield. And then finally, we've got Tulsimir Friend to Wolves. Now I wanted to do Tulsimir last because there's a very, very cool interaction with this card. 
So when Tulsimir Friend to Wolves enters the battlefield, it creates Voja Friend to Elves. Tulsimir also says that whenever a wolf enters the battlefield under your control, that wolf fights something for you, gains three life. But the super duper cool interaction is with Wicked Wolf itself, because Wicked Wolf also has a fight trigger. So you get two fights off of the Wicked Wolf if Tulsimir is on the battlefield. And if you make your wolf indestructible, then you get to kill two things and your wolf stays alive. That's pretty darn cool. So that's Javier Dominguez's Bant food deck. Let's go take a look at Kowalski's Bant Ramp. And finally, we've got Gregor Kowalski's Bant Ramp deck. Now, it looks mighty similar to Javier Dominguez's Bant food, but let's take a look at some of the similarities and the differences. Like Javier's deck, Gregor is playing the food package using the Gilded Goose. We've got Oka Thief of Crowns, and we've got the payoff card in Wicked Wolf. Some of the main differences are in the number of ramp spells that Gregor is playing, because we got an extra copy of Arboreal Grazer and Growth Spiral to help you get to Nissa Who Shakes the World a little bit quicker than the other decks do. In favor of four copies of Questing Beast, as you can see missing from the 4CMC slot, Gregor has opted in for cards like Mass Manipulation to steal games from opponents by stealing their cards, and Agent of Treachery that can steal any of your opponent's biggest threats and bring them over to your side of the battlefield. Similarly to Javier's deck, we're playing key cards such as Hydroid Crisis as a massive finisher to gain your life and draw your cards, and Deputy of Detention to get rid of any threats on the battlefield. Let's take a look at the sideboard. On the sideboard, we've got two copies of Veil of Summer for the blue and black matchups, Aether Gust for the red and green ones, four copies of Disdainful Stroke, two copies of Lovestruck Beast for the aggressive strategies because a 5 5 blocker for three is pretty big. Ashiok Dream Render, which is very good for the Golos matchup because spells and abilities your opponents control can't cause their controller to search their library. So all that ramp that Golos is doing, Ashiok shuts off. Another copy of Wicked Wolf for additional removal. A Time Wipe to obliterate the entire board, barring one of your creatures. And then Tulsimir, Friend to Wolves, which like we saw with Javier's list, also has a very, very cool interaction with the Wicked Wolves in the deck. So there you go, friends. Those are the decks we're gonna see in action. Which of these four players will earn a bind to day two of Mythic Championship 7? Stay tuned to find out. Welcome to MPL Weekly, where we watch that Magic Pro uh, League play every week, <laughs> or some weeks. Hi, I'm back in Scott. Becca's coming in hot. Yeah, you. Marshall Sutcliffe over there. <laughs> Fellas, what a week we have. Uh, it's exciting. For many reasons, it's very exciting. We'll, we'll see a, a death once again to Golos, but uh, we'll get to that. So much to see here. Uh, we have the Ruby Division today. Which We've got Corey we and Corey Shahar here, here too. Shahar Shinhar yeah. hey, hey. of the NPL in the house. Two awesome guests. Absolutely. Oh, thank you. You're too kind. All right, now <laughs> let's go over the format of what's happening here today. So there are four divisions of eight players all in the NPL. Each week features one division where players will play other players in their division. The winner of each match gets two mythic points. Uh, that's after seven rounds of round Robin play and then a tournament bracket, so lots of chances for mythic points. But what do mythic points mean, Marshall? Well, so mythic points primarily serve two roles. One of them is to see if you get to stay in the NPL at the end of the season. And that's starting to shape up here, you can see right here, and also, of course, your uh, slot in the World Championship. Absolutely. It's an only deal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, contrary to that, world champions are a big deal. Why, Corey? Why? Oh, what is I mean, world champs? It's just the most pristine tournament. You know, I mean, it's the it, it's what every Magic player strives to play at one time, myself included. And I mean, shocking that the person at the top is our reigning world champion. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So shocking. Well, uh, you'll see the stars next to three of these players' names: Javier Dominguez being the reigning world champ, who would have secured a spot uh, regardless because of his last weekend winning world 
winning Mythic Championship <laughs> 5, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, but you can't have two stars next to your name. So, uh, yeah. John Manuel Bra, who three. came in second in that tournament, also has a seat at Worlds. And good chances for all these players. Adam Burchett already has their spot secured by winning Mythic Championship 1. That's right. Now, it's there is, um, to stay in the MPLs, you need to have a high amount of Mythic points. How do you do that, Marshall? Yeah, so here? there's going to be some big changes at the end of the season. Uh, you can see that big white line in the middle of the screen. Everybody below that, if the season were to stop today, would no longer be in the MPL. But there's Ouch. good news. So if, <laughs> if one of your favorite players is below that line currently, it does not mean that they have to stay there. There is a lot of runway in front of them between MPL weeklies, but more importantly, the two Mythic Championships yet to come until this year is done. So even though if we snapshot it right now, they might not make it in, they absolutely still have a chance. One big finish could catapult any of these players right up into that safe zone. And let's just take note, number 13 there, Shahar Shinhar with 88 mythic points, not too bad. No, he's looking pretty good yeah, right now. Yeah, and you're gonna see yeah. Shahar later today, who's here to cast with us. So let's take a look at this Ruby division and how their round robin play has gone so far. And you can see four players are five and two. Now we do always take the top four at MPL Weekly and then we watch those players battle it out in a bracket. And in the grand finals, one player will have to win Two, best of three matches, not best of three games, best of three matches. So that's how we've adjusted that a little bit. And uh, this also is a good time to mention, what have we done on tie breaks here? It didn't, it wasn't a case that happened this week, but if yeah. we did have maybe some four and threes. Yeah, there's gonna be a playoff. Yeah, awesome. so they'll be playing a match to see who gets in going forward. This week didn't end up being the case. We had four players with a five and two record. So they're all just cleanly in. This is what we call a clean cut. There was no tie for that uh, fourth to fifth place marker. But if that does happen going forward in the future, instead of it coming down to tiebreakers like opponent match win percentage and things like that, on such a small field with only eight players playing for these four slots, we thought it'd be better to do a playoff, which I think is great. Oh, that's great. I love that change because it, it would feel so so bad to not be able to play yeah. in the top four of this, even though you have the same record as a person who is in fourth place. So great change there. And talking about the top four, let's see what our bracket is going to look like for today in the upper finals. Autumn Perchette on Golos Fires, William Huey Jensen on Bant Food, and then the lower semifinals, Javier Dominguez, of course, world champ and Mythic Championship 5 winner, Bant Food, and Grzegorz Kowalski on Bant Ramp. Now, I see there Autumn Perchette is on Golos Fires, but wasn't there recently? Is there a ban, <laughs> Yeah, there was. So, of course, Field of the Dead has been banned from Standard, but that happened on Monday, and these players had to submit their deck list basically hours after that announcement went up, especially for the ones who were traveling internationally. It just didn't give them enough time in a, in a fair world here to be able to come up with a brand new deck and to adjust to the whole metagame. So the decision was made in the interest of tournament integrity and fairness to let them continue to play with the previous version of standard just for this last one. We'll be transitioning into the, the current band list after this, but this one, it would have been way too much. I mean, you've been in those positions oh, before, yeah. Corey, where you just don't have enough time to really make a, a rational decision. And there's a lot on the line here, right? You get all the mythic points associated with the wins during the MPL weekly play. And then of course, you're playing for that cruise right into day number two at Mythic Championship Absolutely, yeah. Alias just mentioned that in her deck tech. It is a big deal. It's we saw deal. in Mythic Championship 5, the four players that made it straight into day two. And some of them crafted their metagame around that, like Lee Shitian is who I'm thinking of with the Mono Red Cavalcade thinking, uh, it may not be great in day one, but it's gonna be better in day two. <laughs> That's right, yeah. and it worked really well for him. He cruised into, into day three as well. So. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. All right, interesting stuff. There. Uh, what what decks are you excited to see, Corey? Uh, you know, I, I'm really excited to see Gregor Kowalski's uh, take on on Bant Ramp. I, I just think the addition of Agent of Treacheries and Mass Manipulations in the main, I just really want to see if that can catapult him uh, to have an advantage against these other food decks just by going over the top. If you can ever steal like a Nissa or something, that it just seems like lights out, at least for game one. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, that would actually be <laughs> huge for Kowalski because yeah. uh, he's one of the people who's ne in need of mythic points right now to stay in the MP. Out. Yeah, win would be huge for him. Absolutely. Absolutely. So let's look at this head-to-head. -head. We have William Huey Jensen and Autumn Burchette. 
that are gonna have the first match we see here today. Now, Huey is on Bant Food today, but didn't he play Simic Food in the tournament? He did, Simic Food with uh, four Disdainful Strokes as well, just and really Mantec. trying to metagame, uh, you know, against these Golos decks that were just running rampant. I am, I'm interested why he chose to essentially trade out Deputy of Detention for Disdainful Stroke. Um, it, it's a very interesting. I know Manguchi did extremely well, took third place uh, with Bam Food, so maybe that had some influence on him. Marshall, is that because we think we'll see uh, more Oko than Golos? Yes. <laughs> a lot. Yeah, I mean, look, this one's a, a bit up in the air because, you know, the ban was was announced but not in effect for this, but still, I, yeah, I, I think we're going to be seeing tons of Oko going yeah, forward. Yeah, and oh, yeah. Uh, that, that top win, uh, the, Top finishes graphic did say six until last week, so congrats to Huey on that. <laughs> Unstoppable. What do we think? Here's the deck. More thoughts, Corey? Yeah, I mean, this is uh, pretty close to Andre Mangucci's uh, third place Mythic Championship 5 deck list. Just trying to be as focused on being able to compete with Golos and have game against other food decks. Uh, that's kind of why we see Questing Beasts, where Moving forward in the metagame, we're not seeing as many of that because it doesn't match up that well against Wicked Wolf. But in a world where uh, Huey could still play against Golos, which, you know, round one here against Autumn is what, it, what uh, he's going to be playing against, it's a lot more important here. Now, uh, we're going to see Bant Ramp later in the day. What's the main? Oh, and there's those four disdainful strokes on yep. the sideboard instead of still main. Still good cards. Mm. Still good cards, that's for sure. And is there an... What takes the place of Disdainful Stroke in main deck then? Definitely, uh, as far as what Huey played last weekend, it would be like Deputy of Detention, because mm. he stuck with just Simic last week, and that was kind of his only way to deal with Golos, just to stop Golos before it came into play. But now with Deputy of Detention, you don't really need to uh, lean as much on that. You can just actually deal with the zombies at your own pace. Sure, play yeah. out some mana instead of always leaving up two. Exactly. <laughs> okay, here's Anna Burchett's Golos Fire. Love this graphic. Now, <laughs> Many <laughs> cards! <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of lands. Oh, uh, yeah. Now, Golos Fires is distinct from Bant Golos in which way? Definitely Fires of Invention here. Uh, this is going to be the key card here, as you see on our graphics. Just being able to play Fires and then get those two free spells every turn. Use your mana up on, like, Kenrith the Return King. And most importantly, uh, the granted side on Fae of Wishes. Being able to look through your kind of toolbox of sideboard options and really get a card that is specific to the spot that you're being into now, it just allows you to essentially play a 75 card deck without the clutter. Yeah, uh, this deck was really interesting to watch at Mythic Championship 5 because it, I think it was tailored to do well against Bant Golos, but yeah. did less well against more creature heavy, is that right? Yeah, I, 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 it would seem so, but uh, Golos Fires definitely leads to a lot more sweet moments. I mean, Chance of Glory, when you ever get to see oh. one of those ones. I know you were excited uh, yeah. on the Mythic Championships. Five Take an there. extra turn, and at the beginning of that turn's end step, you lose the game if you didn't win. <laughs> yeah, no but pressure. But your creatures gain indestructible, so any type of like mass zombie trades that were going to happen don't. That won't happen in this particular matchup. But this is one of the ways that that can happen. And then, of course, usually the go-to ends up being casualties of war uh, off yeah. of that. Granted, because if you've got you know, three targets, it's kind of like. Oh, oh, yeah. If you can ever get a Planeswalker or a Creature in a Land, it's just uh, yeah. such a swing and you're in the right direction. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, it seems like Huey made a good move switching from Simic Food to Bant Food, and we do have a little recap of his round robin play for you. What's up, friends? Murray here to recap William Huey Jensen's path to the top of the Ruby Division this week. Fresh off a of top eight at Mythic Championship 5, Jensen decided to play almost the same deck that got him to day three, opting this time to bring Bant Food to the table instead of the Simic Food list that nabbed him seventh place in the tournament. To kick off the week, Huey faced MC5 runner-up Jean-Emmanuel Dupra playing the same Bant Golos deck that served him so well last weekend. The first game of their match was one for the ages. Let's look in as Huey opens up the binder and uses Oko to trade his 3-3 Elk for Dupra's Golos. After that, it looked like it was lights out for Dupra's as Huey slams Anissa and a deputy of detention to clear Dupra's board and leave him with just a lonely arboreal grazer in hand. But the power of Golos is its ability to fight back even when it's on the back foot. The very next turn, Dupraz rips a Hydroid Krasis and manages to claw his way back into the game. Do Krasis's have claws? Anyway, check out the board state about 10 minutes later when Dupraz casts this incredible time wipe, bouncing his Krasis back to his hand and securing himself the victory. 
but not to worry. On to game two, where it's Huey who has the haymakers. Here's Huey resolving a crucial Nyssa. Here's Huey countering DePraz's time wipe with a disdainful stroke. And I guess DePraz forgot to say please when he casts this agent of treachery the very next turn. Huey takes the second game and the match. Next up, it was Ken Yukihiro who left the dinos carrying flaming swords back at home and brought the deck of the moment, Bant Food. And I know what you're thinking, a Bant Food mirror? I'd better grab a sandwich and settle in. Well, don't blink because game one lasted less than two minutes after Huey kept a slow hand and Ken's Nissa came down to punish him for it. Huey loses this match 0-2. It was another Bant Food mirror in match three against player of the year, Luis Salvato. Huey's up a game here as we try to count the absurd number of deputy of detentions that come into play. Here's number one, jailing Huey's Oko. Here's number two, as one deputy arrests the other and posts Oko's bail. Here's number three, which hauls Oko into the slammer again. Here's number four that goes after number three and busts out Oko, who is now definitely on the lam. Or should I say the elk? Either way, he starts turning the whole sheriff's department into elk as the game continues. Here's number five returning to Luis's side of the battlefield after a big attack from Huey, which targets number four, releasing number one, who's done trying to capture Oko and just takes in a voracious Hydra. And here's number six, securing the match for Huey and finally bringing some much needed law and order. Sitting at 2-1, Huey now faces fellow Hall of Famer Eric Froelich, who brings the spice with Rakdos' sacrifice. Let's drop in on Game 2 with Jensen up a game. Here we get to see Rakdos do its thing with Priest of Forgotten Gods, forcing Huey to sacrifice his Golden Goose. And here's a claim the firstborn from Fro that steals an elk and smashes. But the raw power of Jensen's deck is just too great in the end, and Ephro's deck needs too many pieces to tick, and most of them are either living under a Deputy of Detention or have become an elk. Huey takes the match. Fellow top four competitor Autumn Burchett is up next with their Golos Fires list that unfortunately never manages to get out of the frying pan and into the fire and is gobbled up in two quick games. But it was Jensen's turn to take a beating in his next match against Zregos Kowalski who quickly bested him 2-0 and nabbed a spot in our top four. Finally, it's our final top four competitor and Mythic Championship 5 winner, Javier Dominguez, who's left the gruel to smash somewhere else and has also opted for Bant food this week. It all came down to game three, which started off like a slightly odd Thanksgiving dinner with a goose on either side of the table. And guess who's coming to dinner? It's Nissa, of course, and when she's your guest, you usually win. I want to point out this cool play here from Javier who uses his Oko to turn his own Hydroid Crasis into an Elk. It does lose flying, but it becomes a 7-7 instead of a 4-4. But it wasn't enough. Huey takes the match and enters play this week in our top four. At MC5, I played Simic Food. Um, my team and I thought that that would be a deck that was going to... We metagamed it for Golos by playing four main deck, um, Disdainful Stroke. And we also thought that because of the mana consistency and the strength of Wicked Wolf and Oko, it would be a deck that would prey on decks that were trying to prey on Golos, which were very aggressive decks. Um, in practice, <laughs> those decks didn't show up in very high numbers. And it was mostly just Golos decks and other food decks. After MC5, I think both from playing the tournament and the results made it pretty clear that Bant food was a little stronger in the food mirror. I expected that this tournament would shake out almost exactly like it shook out, to be honest with you, this split, I mean, with, with a couple Golos decks and a lot of food decks and maybe one rogue deck, whether it was maybe Ken or, or Eric or something like that. Um, and so I opted to go with Bant food to be stronger in... The food matchups, and also I think the results showed from from the Mythic Championship that Bant Food did did just as well, or maybe even better against Golos. So I, I basically changed a few cards, like one main deck card and a couple sideboard cards from Andrea Mangucci's, I guess third or fourth place. I'm not sure exactly where he finished MC5 list, and, and went with that. Autumn is an excellent player. They won Mythic Championship one, and I think it was no fluke. I respect their game very much. Uh, I was able to take our match in the round robin play, but a lot of the matchup comes down to draws and opening hands, specifically on their side. Like when their deck doesn't draw growth spiral or something like that, it's a lot easier for me to win. And I got the good side of it in that. So I guess I'm just hoping to get the good side of it again. All right. We heard from Huey Jensen there with some kind words for okay. Autumn's play. The Always nice to hear from Huey. Now, a couple things I noticed in that round robin play, specifically, well, for one, Javier Dominguez, who just won Mythic Championship 5 on Gruel Aggro, 
Why didn't he bring Gruel Agro, Corey? Well, he just got bored. You know, he, he won with <laughs> Gruel. He definitely was just wanted to mix it up now, win with something else. No, on a real note, I think even Javier wasn't really sure if Gruel was the best choice. He was really going back and forth on it because the food matchup is pretty close. But now the Bant food matchup, I think, is actually really bad from the Gruel side. And now that Bant is kind of reigning as maybe the better uh, food strategy, I think he rightfully uh, left it at home. Yeah, all yeah. right. We're gonna talk food strategies? <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk strategies. Lunch, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, now let's see. Uh, Autumn also had a great uh, round robin week of play, so let's see what they did. Hi friends, Megan here to report on Autumn Burchett's thrilling set of matches in the Ruby division. Burchett made the most of Field of the Dead's last few days in Standard with their Golos Fires deck, a very slightly updated version of the deck that they played to a 12th place finish at last weekend's Mythic Championship. First, Burchett suffered a defeat at the hands of Ken Yukihiro and his Bant Food deck, but they didn't let that loss daunt them as they headed into their next match against Gregor Kowalski on Bant Ramp. In Game 1, Burchett's Agent of Treachery stealing a land quickly put Kowalski out of the game, while Kowalski took Game 2 by maneuvering around, or just through, Burchett's attempts to stabilize. In their final game, Fay of Wishes was Burchett's All-Star, eventually fetching up Nicol Bolas' Dragon God, followed up by Plain Wide Celebration. The proliferate option on the celebration allowed Burchett to ultimate their Bolas, winning the game and the match. Next up was Mythic Championship 5 runner-up Jean-Emmanuel Dupra playing Bant Golos. Burchett's zombie horde overwhelmed Dupra's in Game 1, but in Game 2, Burchett couldn't get a fourth land into play, so it was on to Game 3. No one could decide whose side they were on in a match with more agents of treachery than the Cold War, but it was Fay of Wishes for Burchett that once again won the game, fetching Chance for Glory and then deafening Clarion for a deadly combo. Next, Burchett played against Luis Salvato, who also brought Bant food. Despite quick starts for Salvato both games, Burchett found ways to stabilize. In Game 1, it was a time wipe, followed by Fay of Wishes for Enter the God Eternals and then Plain Wide Celebration. It was a Kenrith the Returned King, however, that really put Salvato out of the game. In Game 2, it was a pair of deafening Clarions that cleared the board, and Kenrith once again secured the win. With four wins to their name, Burchett had a spot in the division playoffs, but a final win against Hall of Famer Eric Froelich would help them secure a top seed for playoffs. Froelich played the rogue deck of the division, Rakdos Sacrifice. Burchett's life gain was too much for the deck, though. Plainwide Celebration and Hydroid Crasses buffered Burchett's life total until Kenrith came down in Game 1, taking the game despite Froelich having the cat and oven combo online. Deafening Clarion and Time Wipe kept the board clear in Game 2 until Kenrith returned yet again to win the day. While it was showy cards that won the division for Burchett, it was Fay of Wishes that consistently shone the brightest, fetching up Burchett's best cards just when they needed them most. And only having plain wide celebration when you need it and can cast it makes that card look great. I actually ended up playing Golos Fires at the MC, and I was a really big fan of the deck running and in, going into that event. Uh, I tested with Aaron Barrich, and we basically decided we just wanted to have Golos and Field of the Dead in our deck, that that was just the best thing you could do in the format. And it felt like the Golos Fires deck was both slightly advantaged in like the pseudo mirrors against the other Golos decks, because you just go bigger than them, thanks to Fate of Wishes. And it was also pretty good against decks that were trying to beat Golos, because one of the problems the Bant Golos deck had was it gave its opponents a lot of time. So it was very good at stabilizing the game, but then they'd still have a few turns to get in those Ember Cleave hits or something like that. Whereas decks that were trying to, trying to target the Golos decks, the Golos Fires deck just turns the corner. It can just kill, kill its opponent out of nowhere with all the mana it has in play, being able to double spell, be really efficient with getting your Ken Rips online, just can end the game in a way that the normal Golos deck can't. I'm against Huey round one, who's on Bant Food. It was actually a matchup I was pretty scared of going into the MC, where the food decks were a lot more popular than Aaron or I were expecting when we tuned our 
files list. Since then, I've put a lot of work into tweaking the deck. I've changed a few sideboard slots with the matchup in mind, and I think that really helps. Uh, I actually think the matchup is pretty even, but the games you lose tend to look very lopsided, whereas a lot of the games you win can look very tight and tricky, which as a result makes things look like it's in food's favor. But in practice, I've been going about 50% in it against all the pro players I went through and two against it in my bracket. I've been very happy with my deck's performance, both in MC5 and in this event. And then in MC5, I ended up coming 12th place. I went four and three on both days, which doesn't sound like the most amazing record, though it's obviously good. But then you remember that, like, you know, the vast majority of my matches there are against MPL players, you know, some of the best players in the world. And I was still getting a positive record with this deck and even putting up a fight in a bunch of the matches I lost. So I've been I've been happy with my deck's record overall. All right, we heard there from Autumn Burchett. What do you think about this matchup in general? It seems to be more difficult to navigate. I think it's really tough. I think game one is especially close because if Autumn gets down, fires, you know, the game is so hard to win from Huey's side. But post board, the disdainful strokes are just going to be so huge that uh, it's going to be a, it's going to be a very good match. Absolutely. Uh, and Marshall, are we going to see uh, maybe an ultimate from Nicol Bolas again? That was pretty sweet. <laughs> that, that was insane. insane. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's a lot of things you can do with plain white celebration. That is one of the weirder ones, but very effective. Yeah. Sure, proliferate. Or just Kenrith was just going crazy yeah. in those yeah. videos. Oh, Man, my. love Kenrith. Yeah. Was, what a insane. king. Yeah. What a king. <laughs> what a, ruler. So a bit of a tyrant, back. but really uh, rules with an iron fist. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> very fun stuff. All right. Uh, well, I think we're almost about ready to get this match underway, so take it away. I'm excited. All right, Corey, let's get into it. All We've right. got uh, Huey on the bottom part of your screen, so we'll be kind of following along with him, but of course, we'll get to see Autumn's hand as well up on the top, and uh, we got a keeper here. Oh yeah, definitely. Fabled Passage looks a little awkward here, but I mean, you just throw it down turn one, and then, uh, you know, use Once Upon a Time and do an Accelerant on two. Definite keeper. Yeah, once upon a time, of course, playing a critical role in standard in multiple archetypes mm -hmm. in these type of decks, it tends to set up the early turns so that you can make sure to hit your land drops or even find your, your ramp creature. Yeah, and then late game just going nuts, getting a crisis and really Ah, look ahead. at that. He got it. He got it. He once oh upon my. a time for a goose. Oh, yeah, yeah, very good point. Might as well do it on turn one uh, to be able to hit the Gilded Goose. You did see Huey pause there because oftentimes they'll play the Fable Passage, crack it, uh, and then do this as their first spell of the game. Yeah. But here, with Huey having access to Paradise Druid and Leafkin Druid, it looks like he's decided, ah, I'll just get rid of this food and go ahead and play out a two drop. I'm curious if this uh, ends up be even being better, because if you get Paradise Druid, you were gonna get a turn two one regardless, and now you lost your food, but mm -hmm. Huey's a much smarter man than I am, Marshall. How about this hand for, uh, for Autumn? Look. We well, see the Deafening Clarion in hand. That's one of the kind of key differences that the Golos Fires deck played uh, over the normal Golos deck. The mana can be rough, but we do see that Autumn has turned three Deafening Clarion at the ready. It's going to be huge. I mean, normally... Especially if Huey doesn't find a land here. Oh, 100%. This will... Oh. Really want Do you run out the Druid? You kind of have to, right? Kind of. I, I actually... I don't think I would. I think I would just try to make a food because then you're not over committing oh, into sure, this. Oh, sure, yeah. sure. And I feel like from Huey's perspective, if you look at the lands that Autumn played, like... You either kept a hand with Bro Spiral or you kept a hand with Deafening Clarion if you're on the draw here. That's what would be going through my head. Kaboom. And I, would be, I would be terrified. Huey agreed with me. Yeah, right? here it comes. Ooh. Deafening Clarion. Now, Boom. Huey does get to respond by making a food, which is fine, but he doesn't have anything to do with it, and he's down to two mana. Oh, no. Now he gets to follow up with the Druid. He draws a Gilded Goose for the turn, but no, that's a little too slow here given his mana issues. Yeah. Land number four hits the battlefield for Autumn and they can go get an unt well, a virtually untapped yeah. land here with Fable Passage. And we see Fires of Invention in hand right now, Corey. I mean, we said, we said it at the beginning, right? Game one is going to be very reliant on Fires of Invention. If you get this down early or have some disruption, like this, this game could be really tough for Huey. If I called it right now, would it be a little too soon? I think it might be a little bit too soon, because I think if we stack the, the top of the decks 
on both sides. Mm -hmm. There might be a chance, but it's it's, but it's, that, it's a might. It's that yeah. far oh, far gone already. 100%. Yeah, hundred percent. So now finally, Huey gets the ball rolling here. Yep. He gets this uh, questing beast on the battlefield. It's going to smash in and knock Burchett down to 14, but this is the key. <laughs> Fay of Wishes, are we gonna see Casualties of War? Yes, we are. Oh yeah. Destroy your artifact, <laughs> destroy your questing beast, destroy your temple garden or island. Yeah, I love, you know, oh I'd my be God. I think if I was on him, I might just take out the druid. Really choke out the mana. Oh, interesting. Yeah, because I mean that four, well, you're gonna deal with that questing beast eventually. Okay. Oh. Well, it looks like Autumn wanted to take the bleeding, stem the bleeding here, and decided to leave Huey with the Leafkin Druid. Yeah. Interesting line, though, from, from you, Corey. That's in, yeah. very aggressive, right? Yeah. But uh, you can see why, because now Jensen with the land here just gets to re-slam with Questing Beast. Yep, old QB really doing what it does best, just smashing out. Now, if, if Huey would have got that down, you know, on turn three, this would be an actually close game here. But it's not right now, is it? Not that much, no. <laughs> yeah, this Fires of Invention, of course, turboing out the plays now for Burchett. Yeah. In a way that Jensen realistically will not be able to keep up with. Oh, I think I might know what might happen. Could get planar cleansing right now. Boom. Oh, and, 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 and with the backup Fires of Invention, exactly. just be ready to go. Definitely a play that wouldn't be made. Oh, yeah, and you get to cast a third yeah. spell now because it goes away. That that interaction is unreal. Good. Who's having fun? <laughs> I know one, one of the person. People. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Yep, Field of the Dead just coming back. Gets banned, still back. Yep. <laughs> That's right. And of course, if you're just tuning in, the, these matches were done with Field of the Dead still available in standard, which is why you see Autumn playing this deck. From now on out though, after uh, the Ruby division here, that will not be the case. Yep. Yeah, I mean, just as a player that's getting ready for one of these big tournaments, only having, for some people that have to fly back home cross country and stuff, only having like four hours before they fly out on Monday to prepare for their split, that would just be a nightmare. So I, I love the decision of, uh, you know, letting them play with uh, the decks that they've been preparing for this whole time. Yeah, it, it, yeah. It's, it's unfair. It really right? is, yeah. you know, And we have a lot on the line here at MPL Weekly. There's mythic points for each match win, plus the, you know, the winner of today will get to advance to day two of Mythic Championship 7. That's worth a ton to these players. If you were with us for our pregame, as we see Autumn put the uh, the finishing touches on game one there. Yep. Um, you know, we, we, got, we got a chance to look at the current standings for the MPL. Yeah. And a lot of those players will not be in the MPL next year. Yeah. And these matches count. So, yeah, having forcing somebody to try to adapt to a brand new metagame that they did not know was coming, right, uh, for sure. You know, a lot of people were thinking, mm, Maybe, maybe feel that they shouldn't be here anymore, but nobody knew what was going to happen. Exactly. You know, and then having to come up with a thing when they just got off an airplane, uh, you <laughs> know, lagged, to Japan yeah. <laughs> or to Europe or even, you know, some of the shorter flights in the United States, it's just too much. 100%. And yeah. after, at the end of one of these Mythic Championships, you're, you're just, you're kind of burnt out. This is something you've been testing for for so long. You just played a demanding tournament. Uh, asking them to do that would be very tough. Rut row. That was a snap mulligan from Huey. Yeah, the double no forest yep. opener. Yep. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's brutal. This one's slow but fine. Temple Garden, Gilded Goose on turn one. With a little yep. bit of luck, we could see a turn two Oko. Yeah, what do, you, what do you do here, Marshall? What do you start with? That's that's such a tough one. Oh, I'm, I'm shooting for the sky. You're going for... Uh... Absolutely, yeah. I hear turn two Oko is kind of good. Hey, I got <laughs> untapped lands in this deck, Corey. I'm going to try to draw one right now. If I don't, I can just play Fabled Passage of Second Goose and move on with my life. Yep, yep. Oh, and Ooh. look at that mystical dispute off the top two, which could give Jensen some good early interaction potentially as you see time wipe in hand here yeah. for Burchett. Ooh, you know, Burchett's hand was a little slow, but top deck in Prison Realm here is insane just something to bridge the gap before you just start going circuitous route and just start going off with field of the dead token so i actually think that was a huge draw definitely clarion maybe would have been a little better but that's uh mm -hmm. that's a close second now things getting interesting for jensen yeah. but thanks to that mystical dispute he gets to cast oko and leave up a counter spell for at least some things that matter maybe mm -hmm. not everything but at least yeah. a few cards but it's just so important to get Oko on the battlefield and get rumbling. Exactly. And most importantly, 
only one Gilded Goose was going to be online if you don't create another food here, so you're, you're not hurting your mana generation. Well, next turn you get to actually start uh, presenting some threats. Yeah, I'm sure Jensen would have liked to start bashing with a food token there, but the yeah. prospect of getting Deafening Clarion is a little much. Yeah. And I think even one more step above that, I think Huey would have really liked to have been starting to smash with a Nissa. Mm. That would have been nice. Needed a land there, though. Well, he can do it here. Oh. Oh, oh that's a rough. Oh, yeah. Just that's a whammy. The turn. He's going to have to ship it back. But yeah. he does have a copy of Ether Gust and Mystical Dispute mm -hmm. to take care of the Circuitous Route. So he's going to go for the Gust. Okay. Going for the Tempo play here. I think I'd put that on bottom. Um, with, with an additional with having hand. an additional circuitous okay. route in hand, um, but looks like Autumn decided to keep it on top. Just generate a ton of mana. All right, once upon a time, oh, not hitting that land. Unbelievable. Jeez. Unbelievable for Jensen here. There's Feel of the Dead. Yes, legal for this tournament. No longer legal. This is. Really, truly the last ride of Field of the Dead. You will not be seeing it on your screen anytime yeah. after this tournament. But uh, Autumn doing good work with it said, hey, if I can use it, I'm gone. I'll use it. Yeah, and here comes the zombies. It's going to be huge. This could be over very quickly, Corey. I, you know, the first game wasn't particularly competitive. And at this point, Jensen finally finding that forest. He can play Nyssa, but is it just too late? I don't know, because Nyssa here can untap the island. Not going to be able to attack, because that's a lovely double block for the, two, uh, for the two zombies. But then you have Mystical Dispute for a Hydroid Crisis, for a Time Wipe. And Autumn happens to have both. So maybe this Mystical Dispute is going to be just enough uh, to get Huey back into this game. But it is going to be a really tough game here. All right. Another Field of the Dead. But yeah, even solving that problem of just a timely counterspell right here, is it even going to be enough against a horde of zombies? One of the ways, of course, that you know you could think that something could happen here is that Jensen has switched over to Bant food, yep. which gives him access to Deputy of Detention, which can at least temporarily wipe away zombies. Yep. I, maybe, I, I just keep looking at the life total of Burchett at 17 life. Whoa, oh, I was gonna say Huey's not even gonna counter that, but yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it's but, just gonna but be as tough you know, Hydroid Crisis punishes you whether you get countered or not. It really does. And with Huey out of counter spells now, if Huey starts to go crazy on animating your lands, which why wouldn't you hear a uh, time wipe is just going to kind of, you know, blow Huey out here. Mm -hmm. This could be a giant crisis, though. Yeah, yeah, two, four, six, plus the island makes one. Plus you could untap. Yeah, yeah. make it eight. Yeah, yeah. You could do one for seven. I kind of have to, right? I, I just don't know how you get out of this mess if you're sitting in Jensen's seat otherwise. You also have to protect Nissa here, though, and with oh. that line, with that line, you have one giant blocker with Krasis, and then at that point, you have to throw a goose away, but the Gilded Goose realistically isn't doing a ton right now. Okay, so maybe it's yeah. worth it to throw a goose away? Might be. Another interesting line here is if Huey decides to go questing beast, Huey can actually attack with make a really sizable attack because there's only one zombie back, so both oh. of those lands could get in there. But I think Huey just recognized, like, hey, I'm too far behind. I need to do something to generate some cards back and just hope for the best that there's not a huge turn uh, from Autumn next time. And let's see if that's the case here, because if Autumn has one of those turns, yeah. which it looks like they will, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> yeah. I see that time wipe kind of looming up there yeah. in Autumn's hand. Uh, we could be done here. I don't know what exactly those turns are, but this has got to be one of them, because that yes. this, this turn looks really bad for Huey. Curious to see if Huey does the full call. He does. Yep. He says, I'm losing my board anyway. <laughs> yeah. Jensen knows what's up. Is it time wipe time? Oh, it's time wipe o'clock. About a half past time wipe around here. Yeah, then play a field of the dead. And you can't even fires into time wipe, but I don't think fires is even that necessary right now, just because Autumn doesn't have, you know, the Fey of Wishes plan to really start going off with fires. At this point, just having the mana allows, allows them to just cast all their spells anyways. Mm -hmm. Gets to return a zombie. Not bad. Return a zombie return to the hand. Return a zombie to your yeah. hand. And hey, look, it's back. 
All right, and now this is just so much power yeah, where... Yeah, who's having fun? Once again, Autumn is having all the fun here. Yeah, Autumn really flexing here. Yeah. Showing what this deck is all about and how good it can really be. And QB well, Jensen good here, just, but... Uh, yeah. If Autumn was at a little lower life total, this QB would uh, be relevant, but right now it uh, doesn't seem like it's going to be fast enough to me. Jensen's going to be able to have Disdainful Stroke mana available here for some big play, but yeah. the unfortunate part from Jensen's perspective is that Autumn can just play two really good things this turn. That's the thing. I think we're going to see, in this sense, which it's kind of weird to say, but a bait of fire, Fires of Invention. When that gets countered like it more than likely has to, you just play a giant Beanstalk Giant, and then at least you have something to get in the way of Questing Beast, mm. at least for one turn. Mm -hmm. Or you just go nuts and just double skew this route and say, hey, have a deputy. Sure. But problem number one is off the board right now, uh, which is Nissa who shakes the world. Now Huey is limited to just three mana here when... I'm not a mathematician, Huey, but, or uh, Marshall, but mm -hmm. I think Autumn has more than three yeah, 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 I did a quick count. <laughs> so we're going to see a Disdainful Stroke hit Beanstalk Giant, which is going to open up the way. Yeah for some damage here from the Questing Beast is there will only be zombies left behind. Yeah. Unfortunately, there's gonna be a lot of zombies <laughs> left behind if you're sitting in Huey's seat. Yeah. The, but, cran the Cranberry song just keeps rolling through my head whenever I see that stack of giant zombies coming down. Do you have to let it linger? You have to, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is, uh, this is disgusting here. Autumn Burchett putting on a show. Yeah. And maybe showing us why Phil did go banned. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe. Oko is surviving, and uh, I don't think Oko would catch up with these uh, zombies as as it stands now. Confirmed. I mean, there was Deputy, but you see, Huey's just like, I, I, I can't take that. I need to have Disdainful Stroke Man open and hope that Autumn is just on blanks, but you know what? What's a blank right now? Right? Like a land is completely fine. Yeah, there are none. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, land is four, is two zombies, and then any spell is more. More stuff. But yeah. Autumn, of course, recognizes it's time just to put the pedal to the metal, so in comes the team. Oh, yeah. Sure, I'll t throw away two zombies to get in for <clears throat> 14 <laughs> damage. Yeah, no big deal. It seems fine, I no guess. No big deal. And this Fires of Invention is not even that good. Like, no. this is where it's like, sure, why not Fires of Invention? You know you're really far ahead when that's the blank, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Autumn's now just going to be thinking about what you mentioned a minute ago, which is, you know, show me a deputy. Yeah. Uh, and maybe questioning, should I play out this land or not? Ultimately, they decide, yeah, let's just do yeah. it. And look at this play by uh, Autumn. I love this. Not not um, deploying the Secutus route, because if you do the math on the board here, even if Huey were to put out like one or two blockers that isn't a deputy, lethal is still being presented next turn, so I like not putting all your eggs in one basket. All right. <laughs> I think Huey right here is really contemplating uh, just getting a little extra camera time in. Uh, <laughs> He's like, come check out my stream. Yeah, 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 <laughs> no kidding. And that's going to be it. Yeah, and that's going to do yeah. it. Autumn Burchett with the seemingly easy victory there. Yeah. Cruising in both games against the stumbling William Huey Jensen. Congrats to yeah. Autumn, and I think you nailed it, Marshall, when you said... I think we just saw what feels the dead cup fans. <laughs> yeah. So uh, thanks for everybody uh, watching. Obviously, these players did not have time to prepare new decks after just competing in a tournament, uh, which all of their play was fantastic and so much fun to watch. Mythic Absolutely. Championship Five. Uh, yeah. Wow. Uh, rough time for Huey. Yeah. Just, just not the right set of draws. You know, a lot of times if Huey got a land early on. He was able to capitalize with like Questing Beast or capitalize with Nissa, but it just wasn't there. Every time you need a land, it was like a Gilded Goose or, or some reactive spell like uh, Mystical Dispute. And you just really need to draw those kind of counter spells after you already have these really good threats in play. And we've seen that time yeah. and time again from these Simic based decks yep. coming from behind, not their forte. Not impossible. They do have certain sequences that can get them from when they're kind of behind, but when they get that far behind, no way. There's and, just no reset button. And Deputy allows a little bit more of a reset button in this situation, and if Huey could have drew that at the last possible turn, maybe it would have been enough, because Autumn was running out of steam, and that is a little bit better than the Simic food as far as rebooting, Yeah. but 
the draws just weren't there in the bit in the beginning, so there wasn't really anything to reboot to. Well, and and, yeah. and like in that sequence, if he had drawn it, gotten rid of it, and said go, Autumn would have had circuitous route plus land the next turn with two fields on the battlefield. Six more it's zombies. Like, whoop, yep, it's pretty sick. power. <laughs> uh, but Huey's not out of today yet. He has a chance to go down to the lower bracket and then make it back up to rematch against Autumn. So let's hear Autumn's thoughts on how they felt right after this match. All right, I am joined here by Autumn Burchett, uh, who quickly dismantled William Huey Jensen in the last round. So, Autumn, uh, I mean, kind of going into this top four, you kind of just decided to run it back. So could you could you tell, tell us maybe why you chose to do that? So there was a couple different reasons. One of them is I'm just a big, big fan of this deck. I think... Uh, back in back before the ban, this was the most powerful thing you could do in standard in terms of raw power level, because you get all the long game that Field of the Dead gives you, and Go Lost gives you, but you also get this explosiveness from Fires of Invention, like Fires with Fey to go get a card like Casualties of War, or Fires working with Kenrith to just kill your opponent out of nowhere. You get so much raw power added onto the grind of Field of the Dead. So that's part of the reason. Uh, the other reason is, of course, I just had the MC last weekend. I had a pretty good result with the deck. Pretty happy about how it went. And I was going to be, you know, spending a whole day traveling back here, having to have my article in for Wednesday, having to do the Legacy Premier League last night, just a whole bunch of stuff all at once. And I felt like it would be better just for me to play a deck I was comfy with. I could do a few little bits of tuning to based on how the MC went, rather than having to pick up a whole new archetype like food, which I've just not played with very much. And now kind of coming into also this week's play, did you expect the metagame to maybe change a little bit due to the results of Mythic Championship 5? I kind of just expected a ton of food decks. I expected maybe a go lost player or two. I certainly expected Jean Emmanuel to run it back. He is extremely skilled with that deck. But I expected most of the field to be on food. There were already a few players in the field who played food at the MC to good results. And then I thought the others would look at the statistics behind the deck and be like, well, this is what we should be playing. So it was kind of nice coming into the tournament knowing that it meant I could really tune my sideboard towards the food deck. You only get about four or five true sideboard slots in this archetype because you need your wishboard. And as it is, I have four of those slots set so that they can come in against the food deck, which is great. And could you tell us a little bit about kind of, like you said, you had a, a bit of a busy week. I mean, what is it like to just fly straight home and then just start jamming matches of of MPL Weekly. I mean, have you even had time to kind of recover from that jet lag? It's been intense coming back so suddenly and going straight into these matches. I actually made a pretty horrendous misclick against Ken Yukihiro on Tuesday. Um, <laughs> I just untapped, played my fourth land, Went to click on a circuitous route, clicked the Fey of Wishes instead, just because Ooh. the jet lag was hitting me. And after that, I was like, "Okay, I need to, I need to focus." Um, but I don't know. It's kind of been the case that, like, normally when I get home, I have a couple of days to rest, recovering from the jet lag. Whereas this, I'm just having to force my way through it because I've just got so many things that I need to be doing. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, th this this end of the year is is, is kind of uh, kind of crazy. We have, of course, another Mythic Championship coming up in two weeks. On top of that, I'm start doing my first draft of the format tomorrow. Like, uh, okay. I've got so much on my plate right now; it's unreal. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, that's that's now the life of a of a Magic Pro. Uh, okay, right, well, one last question. You know, uh, a, a lot of people also, of course, bringing Bant and Golos. Why is this version of the deck better than Bant Golos? I think it's better in like the pseudo mirrors. I think if you get paired against Bant Golos, you'd rather be on the fire side, not by a wide margin. They certainly can 
win games. If they get Agent of Treachery heavy draws, that's pretty problematic for you. But the Fae of Wishes board lets you go over the top of them a lot of the time. But on top of that, you're way better against decks that are targeting you. Um, so against the aggressive decks with Embercleave, if you play a Bank Golos deck, you, what's going to happen a lot of the time is you're probably going to wrap their board once. You're going to get your Field of the Dead online and have some blockers. Sometimes, though, even on turn 10, they can still set up an Ember Cleave with a Rotting Regasaur and hit you, or on a Questing Beast or whatever, and still kill you. Because you just don't have that closing speed. You're very reliant on your zombies to keep you alive into the super late game. Whereas Fire's Golos has the ability to just kill its opponents out of nowhere by, you know, go find my Kenrith. I have eight mana untapped because of fires, so I get to immediately reanimate, go lost, and attack with everything. Just kill you out of nowhere. Or the alternatively, you have the ability to answer everything. So you get to this late game and you go, okay, you have burn spells in your deck as reach. I'm going to go get plain white celebration and gain 16 life. Or okay, you have this ember cleave I'm going to go get Casualties of War, blow up that, blow up one of your the red sources in your shaky mana base, so it's hard for you to even cast another one. Like, you just have a lot more angles of attack than Bangor Loss, which makes it much harder for people to hate you out of the format. You know, this will be uh, basically the Golos' deck's last hurrah, and you are making every match count. Uh, and uh, again, congratulations, making it all the way to the finals. And uh, yeah, best of luck there. Thanks. All right, awesome to see Autumn talking about their match win right there. It, it's really interesting to get the insight into how much pressure is on these MPL players to just always be testing and always being expected to do very well because you are a pro player. Um, yeah. Uh, and Autumn saying that they just now are going to get to do their first draft of the format. Have you drafted Corey? Uh, I've only drafted like three times so far. You know, most of my uh, content I make is uh, standard based, you know, so diving into that new format usually comes with standard first, like, you know, probably a lot of other content creators. And especially for MPL, having to do all this extra work on top of, they're all still content creators as well, so it's a lot of pressure to get limited in when you're playing a standard only arena championship so hey, what's i feel a lot of pain for? on that one yeah, yeah. I, I gotta go home and draft you after this <laughs> so now marshall you're I, friends I with too. a lot of these players what do you see i gotta go home and draft after this okay too. got it we know yeah. you wanna draft together? mr yeah, limited resources okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah no it is interesting because now everybody's trying to get caught up Right, uh, and, and it's actually been like that for me because you know my play patterns will usually like I have to draft a bunch um, to be prepared for the podcast, but for my commentary, limited resources. <laughs> <laughs> nice plug. <laughs> for my for my commentary though, I need to know what's going on in these things. Yeah. I can't set up my co commentators if I don't know these formats, these cards, what's happening. So I play a lot of standard as well leading up, and I've only been playing standard for a while too. I mean, it was MPL Weekly. E-League Showdown, Mythic Championship, now an MPL Weekly, all standard, you know? Yeah. And I mean, I get my drafts in, don't, don't worry about me, but, <laughs> uh, but it is interesting because now everybody, you definitely uh, can start to really feel the focus shift towards the limited portion because everybody's trying to play catch up. And yeah, it's it, so hard when we have all these big events demanding all our attention, <laughs> what was us? And I think it's crazy that this may be the shortest time that it's been from Mythic Championship to another Mythic Championship, like two weeks after they just got done with one, that's super, fast. that's insane. I mean, I only have to prepare for one of them, but when you got those back to back, that does a lot of work it, for these MPL players. Definitely. Yeah. Well, holidays slow down for some industries, but speeds up for magic. Love it. <laughs> We're going to have a lot more matches coming at you for the rest of the afternoon. Don't go anywhere. Stay tuned after this break. Welcome back to MPL Weekly. I'm Becca Scott. We have Corey Baumeister hey, and. Hey. Two-time world champion Shahar Shinar in Hello, the everyone. house. Beast. Glad to be here. <laughs> uh, Shahar, such a pleasure to have you here, all the way from Vegas. Yeah, thank you. A long, a long flight, right? Yeah, real <laughs> long, one-hour flight. Yeah, I feel like great. you could have walked here and made it. Probably. <laughs> Starting uh, when, though? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I could have walked here and made it eventually too from Virginia, but. 
Well, I started a month maybe ago. next time. Yeah. I challenge you. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> uh, speaking of challenges, we saw an interesting match just now between Autumn Burchett and Huey Jensen. Yep. Of course, we saw the power of the Golos Fire deck and Golos decks in general, which, of course, Field of the Dead is now banned. Now, yeah. Shahar, what does it mean uh, for the standard format? What do you think we'll see kind of evolve in what was Golos and Field of the Dead holding back? Yeah, I mean, I think that's the question that everyone's been asking once Field of the Dead is gone and Oko has been so dominant in the last MC. Uh, I think that there's going to be a lot of Oko still, but there's going to be a lot of other ways to interact with Oko that previously weren't really possible because the Golos deck was just stopping it. For example, cards like Garrick, right? Or cards um, like Noxious Grass that you just couldn't really main deck. Yeah. No, I, I think that's uh, nailing it on top of the head. I think there was also like room for control decks to kind of pop up again. You right. know, uh, it's something that when you're just spot removal, trying to target different creatures in the metagame, whenever you just make a bunch of zombies and you're trying to spot removal them, like you just, you can't do that. You know, I mean, it, it, it really closes the door on those type of strategies. As well as like these uh, green-black adventure strategies, or even green-white adventure strategies, I think are gonna get a big push because Golos, the Wrath effects, the Wrath of God effects, you know, Realm Cloak Giant, uh, Deafening Clarion, really cut those uh, small ball creatures just cut the legs out from under them. But now that you don't have a ton of those in, you get to see more adventure cards coming and more sweet stuff from Throne of Eldraine. Green Black Adventures is kind of my favorite. Absolutely. So far. Well, so. we should mention Piotr Golgowski, who won his yeah. split, <laughs> the Sapphire Division, which was before Mythic Championship 5. He yeah. actually won against some Bant Golos decks, which was very impressive to see. That deck didn't do quite as well at Mythic Championship 5, but. Do you think, well, you're saying it has a lot of potential yeah. to come back now? I mean, I think it's adventures. great. I think it's great because now instead of having to play all these super fast cards to kind of deal with uh, Golos, you get to play cards like Shahar said, like Garrick. And Garrick yeah. is just excellent against these food strategies where you just, they have Wicked Wolf, which is like an insanely hard threat to deal with when you try to murder us, right, or something like that. But when you just go Garrick, make a couple wolves, chump block, and then eventually that emblem is basically unbeatable. I mean, just overrun constantly, it's, it's, it's quite insane. Absolutely. I think the bottom line is that control decks just couldn't really compete because Golos and with Field of Ruin, you're just not gonna be able to play the late game with them. You're just gonna lose because they're gonna play lands and their spells are also lands. Yeah. You're not gonna get there. So now that's actually possible. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, let's take a look at our bracket so far today. So this is our, our top four after round robin play during the week of the Ruby Division. And of course, you see Autumn Burchett going straight to grand finals after their first upper finals match. Uh, a quick 2-0 victory. If you weren't watching, well, you're going to have to watch that replay later. Uh, now we're going to check out lower semifinals so we can pair Huey up with someone else. So we have Javier Dominguez, world champion and uh, reigning world champ, and of course, just won Mythic Championship 5 last weekend, who switched yep. up his deck. Just on fire. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. And Grzegorz Kowalski on Vant Ramp, which is impressive that he is in the top four today. Definitely helpful yeah. Mythic points for him. Uh, yeah, tell me about uh, these players. Well, I think this is really exciting because when Javier Dominguez won Worlds this year, he's our reigning world champion, you know who he beat in the finals? Who? Gregor's Kowalski. Oh. So this is a rematch of our last world tournament, and I believe you were somewhere up there too, huh? Uh, don't say it. Don't say it. <laughs> yeah, Where were did, you? Where did, were you? He did, in fact, beat me in the top four, and then and then played Gregor uh, in the finals oh. and uh, defeated him as well. So. Yeah. Yeah, Top Javier is having a, quite a year. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I know he's, I read an article Corbin wrote recently about uh, how he was worried that he'd lose his drive after winning Worlds, and that, uh, well. that didn't happen. <laughs> yeah, apparently he, uh, instead of lost his drive, he just went pedal to the Absolutely. metal and just keeps winning everything. Now we're going to take a look at these decks in a minute, um, but Shahar, I want you to tell me the difference between Vant Ramp and Vant Food, and whether you think that distinction needs to be there. Well, I'm not sure the distinction needs to be there because it is quite close. Um, basically, the main difference in this list is that Gregor is playing Agent of Treachery and Mass Manipulation and only two copies of Wicked Wolf. And also, if you notice, there is your favorite card, QB, Questing Beast, <laughs> missing in this list. So uh, yeah. it's a little bit more up to the top going, trying to ramp up and trying to get to the late game. But the food deck also does very similar things. Absolutely. Let's yeah. see what's in Gregor's sideboard. All right. Anything stand out, Corey? 
You know, nothing that stands out, but uh, one thing about uh, Gregor's main deck, it is, you know, you have Grazer, you have Gross Spiral, and you don't have Questing Beast. So I think Gregor's was not as concerned with beating Golos, was much more concerned with having a good mirror match. And you know, this is uh, kind of what he's got. So it's, uh, and only one Ashiok I think is pretty interesting in a still Golos metagame. I think that's uh, a little risky, don't you? <laughs> Very good call for this tournament oh, though. Yeah. I mean, if you look, there's what, six bad tournaments, uh, band players, so. Yeah. Okay, and Javier on Bant Food, and we talked a little bit about this earlier, but for people just joining us, why do you think he chose not to bring the Gruel Aggro that he just won the tournament with? You know, I mean, Javier, like I said before, he, he wasn't even 100% sure if that was a great call for the metagame. He was really on the fence between that and kind of this deck, the Bant Food, which Andrea Mangucci played to great success. Um, I think Focusing on the Gruel matchups towards these food matchups, it's pretty rough. Like, like Wicked Wolf against Gruel is just a beating. If you ever get your questing beast, Wicked Wolf, and they were generated, Absolutely. it feels really bad. What, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, that's part of the reason that Gregor's cut the questing beast out of the deck because he's just yeah. worried to face against Wicked Wolf all day long. Questing beast is not a very good card against Wicked Wolf. Yep. Pretty good against the rest of the cards, but. Not really, Wicked Wolf. really good against the horde of zombies that yeah. you're gonna see if if uh, he does make it all the way to the finals to play against Autumn. A lot more one ofs in this sideboard for Javier. What's yeah. that about? Yeah, he, it's because he's playing granted to certain. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. This is uh, this is quite the random sideboard. I mean, the three disdainful strokes to bring it all the way up to four copies makes a lot of sense to me. But you know, I, Javier is a much better player than me, so I'm not gonna question his ways. All right. <laughs> So those are the decks. Interesting. Pretty, not quite a mirror, but uh, pretty close. Yeah, quite close, yeah. yeah. Some distinct differences, though. You know, I mean, it's, it's going to be interesting to see if these over-the-top cards are going to play a factor. Sure. Or if the Questing Beast is actually going to actually get them beat yeah. down. I mean, it's still got so many keywords, Gregor's right? Before can get mass manipulation down or anything like that. Exactly. It's hard to be bad when it has that many yeah. words on the card. Yeah. <laughs> can you tell me exactly what it does? Uh, can we cut? <laughs> <laughs> I can do it. I'm not going to do it. All right. Uh, so, of course, these players played seven rounds. Round Robin played throughout the week before these matches we're watching today. So let's see Grzegorz Kowalski's 5-2 and two record. Golos may have been the most feared deck heading into Mythic Championship 5 last week, but it turned out that Oko Nissa decks were some of the most successful in the field, because this week was an absolute food fight as five of the top eight competitors brought a deck focused around the powerful new throne of Eldraine archetype. And after a rough start, it looked like it might be a little more famine than feasts for Greg Kowalski. He opened with a quick win over Eric Froelich, who brought a black red aggro deck, but lost two decisive games where he struggled out of the starting gates and Kowalski had early Gilded Goose into Oko Thief of Crowns. But things went downhill for there. First, it was against Autumn Burchett, who was getting in a last run with Golos Fires this week. They had a fast Securitas Roots, followed by a big crisis to take the first game quickly. Kowalski fought back in the next one, leveraging a key disdainful stroke on a wished-for casualties of war, while Oko continued to send 3-3s at Burchett. But Kowalski struggled to get off the ground in the third game, and as he flooded out, Burchett wished for shared summons and dealt him a loss, even adding Nicol Bolas for style points along the way. It didn't get better. Javier Dominguez, fresh off his Mythic Championship victory, dealt Kowalski another loss as they played a lengthy banned food mirror. They had dueling turn two Okos in the first game, but three Hydroid Krasis were simply too much to overcome as Dominguez took the first game. Kowalski would take the next one, but in the decider it was Dominguez who had all of the answers. He landed a giant 10-10 Krasis and then had the all-important Veil of Summer to protect it on Kowalski's turn. That left Kowalski at one and two, meaning he'd have to win out to make the top four. And if he was going to pull it off, he was going to have to go through the other Mythic Championship 5 finalist, John Emmanuel Praz, who ran back his Golos field deck. But turn 2 Oko is a good way to do that. It gave Kowalski the first game, and in the third game, Oko's buddies Nissa came down a turn early and gave Kowalski a huge lead in a game he eventually won with a timely deputy of detention to clear out a zombie horde. It was a great first step, and next up came one of the wildest food mirrors you will ever see. Kowalski took the first game, and the second turned out to be an epic, almost hour-long affair. Kowalski started things off with a turn two Oko, but the thief wasn't going to steal this game easily. 
the pair traded Wicked Wolves, Veil of Summers, and Agents of Treachery, and even a 12-12 Hydroid Crisis for Kowalski wasn't enough to seal the game, as the board flooded with creatures and planeswalkers. Kowalski even managed to ultimate Nyssa, who truly shook the world in this one. But that wasn't enough either. It wasn't until he cast an 1818 Hydroid Crisis that Jensen had finally seen enough and conceded the match. Kowalski had already faced two world champions, and next up was the reigning player of the year in Luis Salvato. Fortunately for Kowalski, he did what his deck does best, cast Oko on turn two and Nissa on turn four. He took two quick games on the back of his Planeswalkers, and with that found himself with a final match against Ken Yukihiro with a shot at the top four on the line. It was one more food mirror to decide it all, and it was Yukihiro who took the lead, taking the first game on the back of a team of super friends. Oko, Nissa, and Teferi all hit the board under his control, and that outpaced anything Kowalski could offer up. But where there's a will, there's a turn to Oko. Kowalski took a lightning fast second game thanks to the Thief of Crowns, bringing it all down to a third and final game. With the top four on the line, Kowalski had Aether Gust to keep Yukihiro's Oko from hitting the board, and then used his own Wicked Wolf to get ahead. The players continued to trade resources from there, but a 6-6 Hydroid Crisis for Kowalski allowed him to pull ahead on cards, and he leveraged that into the ultimate Mirror Breaker, Mass Manipulation. It's not just Oko that can steal things in the Bant food deck, and the manipulation stole Krasis and Oko from Yukihiro, securing Kowalski a spot in the top four in dramatic fashion. I just decided to play the deck. Uh, I played in the MC. I think it was a really good deck. Uh, we had pretty big uh, win percentage on the on the tournament. Also, Stan Steve came out top eight with that, and like I expected field on the on the MPR speed to be similar to uh to the MC because people also didn't have much time to prepare so they stayed with what I what I liked. Mass manipulation is replacing one one agent and I expected this week to be more food oriented than, than Golos and mass manipulation is way better against food decks because you can steal multiple permanents. Like the games are super slow. It's basically who draws more cards from crazies, who plays more planeswalkers and stuff like that. So you can just like gather a lot of mana, play X3, steal Nisa, steal Oko, steal big crazies, and just win the game on the spot. And people usually don't have uh, ways to to interact, especially game one. It's a little bit worse against Golos decks because you can't steal Field of the Dead. But I think advantage in the mirror is is worth it. Against Javier, I think in terms of deck lists, I'm a little ahead because agent and mass manipulations. But but against Javier in general, I think I have some Javier scares because since the beginning of Worlds 2018, I think I'm 07 or 08 against him. I just couldn't win a single match, including the the Swiss match of of the MPL this speed. So I hope to break this finally today. But, you know, everything can happen. All right, we heard from Gersegersh there. So he, we just saw in the round robin, Javier took the match. Um, yeah. And the last any... seven matches, he said. Yeah, and absolutely. he's 0 and 8 against them. <laughs> yeah, Shahar, I want to know if you think there's any truth to this Javier curse he speaks of. Well, I don't think anybody has been Javier this year, so everybody's <laughs> cursed if you, t if you think about it that way. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I have the same thing with Brad. I just I play against Brad in any premium level tournament, and I always lose. But so. he's your older brother. I, mean, I know. What are you gonna do? I know. He I gets mean, into my how, head, man. That's what older brothers are supposed to do. Yeah. 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 You Beat take up on away the every, brother. Yeah. You yeah. take away exactly. all that he has. Yeah. Should you? It's supposed to be him. physically though, not in the game. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Sure. Anyway, let's watch Javier's weekly play. Having foolishly chosen Gruul Agro to win Mythic Championship 5 last week, Javier Dominguez brought a deck to the MPL featuring never-before-seen cards like Paradise Druid, Oko Thief of Crowns, Questing Beast and Wicked Wolf. Against MC5 finalist Jean-Emmanuel Dupra, it was a case of different decks, same outcome. Here, facing a third defeat on two continents in four days, Dupra successfully staved off a disdainful stroke with his own Veil of Summer, only to die next turn to the Questing Beast plus support. Gregor Kowalski pushed Dominguez to three games before the Mythic Championship 5 champion put him to minus 19. That's minus n, -n, -n 19. 
This was Mythic Championship 5 champion Javier Dominguez's screen before his match against Eric Froelich. For a moment, I thought it was the board state. Now, this is a board state. Froelich was playing Rakdos Sacrifice. Since this contains neither the word Bant nor the word Golos, he wasn't going to win, and he didn't. In game two against Luis Salvato, he cast the Yoko, but he did not cast the deputy. Oh, wait, apparently he did. And then he won the game and the match. Okay, fine. Spoiler great song reference. Why don't you? No, no, we've talked about this. I refuse to acknowledge that William Jensen beat our glorious Mythic Championship 5 champion, setting up a must win against Ken Yukihiro for our hero. And here, oh, it is. Dominguez, $100,000 richer from Mythic Championship 5, took the opener when Disdainful Stroke took out the Wicked Wolf, allowing him to set Nyssa alongside a very, very large Oko. Game 2 was enormous. I'm showing you this sequence so I can say, Wicked! Wick, 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 wicked Wolf! Wicked Wolf! Wa-wa-wa-wa-wa-wa-wa-wa! Wicked Wolf! Which makes me simultaneously delighted and concerned for my mental well-being. Yokohira fought hard in the decider, but this was Javier Dominguez, the Mythic Championship 5 champion. He does not lose, except for those matches where he does, obviously. One more enormous attack, and it was a 5-2 record and a seat in the top four. Have I mentioned this? Mythic Championship 5 champion, 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 Javier Dominguez. Well, it has a little bit of a rush. Like I just got home, took a nap, and then we couple play. So it's <laughs> it still has. I still haven't have time to like you know celebrate or whatever. So I'm still just you know like just playing, 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 playing. Uh, yeah, definitely really happy. Like it just feels like you know uh, these days like cards are running my way, and let's see if I can you know keep it going. <laughs> I choose to bring my food over Gruul, even though Gruul obviously went very well in the Mythic Championship because I expected a different metagame and, and I also felt like the band food was impressive in the MC. Like it just felt to me like it was probably the best deck. I don't really know about the win rates, but it just felt to me like on the battlefield like it was a very good deck. And I think Gruul would not be very good if there was not enough Golos in the split, which ultimately yeah, ended up being well because there were like only two, two Golos, so I'm happy about playing food this time. I think the matchup against Greg is definitely similar to a mirror match. Uh, Greg is always a tough opponent, so I will say like it's a very 50-50 matchup. Yeah, I don't even know which deck both has the advantage, but if if any of us has an advantage, has an advantage, it's gonna be like super small, like 52 or 51 or something. Winning the, the division would obviously feel like great. I mean, <laughs> even after coming from the MC, just you know, these kind of victories against this kind of oppositions always like. I think it's like a huge accomplishment and uh, every single time it happens. So, um, yeah, I mean, I want to try. All right. I think you put it, uh, the MC winning smile right there is how you put it, Corey, huh? Oh, yeah. That <laughs> smile has not left his face from last weekend, that's for sure. Jealous got, got off the flight, <laughs> yeah. got to do the interview. He wakes up that not way. Away, yeah. He wakes yeah. up that way, for Absolutely. sure. Absolutely. <laughs> oh, sunshine. Yeah. Uh, do you think he's right, Jahar, about uh, the matchup is pretty even? Yeah, I think it is quite even. Uh, again, mass manipulation and agent of treachery. So Gregorsh is actually just going to have to be the control player. He's going to have to survive long enough. And uh, Javier just has a chance of being down with Questing Beast if Gregorsh doesn't draw his two Wicked Wolves. So. Yep. All right. Well, I like that he gave his respect, saying that Gregorsh is a, a hearty opponent. And uh, obviously, we're going to have a fun match to watch, so let's get into it. It's going to be a good one. All right, so kicking it off here, Javier on the play. I mean, this hand seems sweet, right? I mean, no turn two Oko, but turn three Questing Beast, like you said, could just uh, really shape the way this matchup is played. Right, I mean, maybe he'll draw uh, the Goose and get the turn three Nissa. He does have the draw for it, yeah. so once upon a time or Goose can get him there. Yeah, so what do you, uh, what do you like as far as uh, matchups here? I, I know it's, it's quite close, but is there anybody you'd give a favor to? I think I would probably give a favor to Gregor's despite being down 08. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I like that uh, uh, Javier says, you know, always a close match and he's just got him eight times. Right. But yeah. looking, at, looking at these hands, uh, yeah. honestly, I think Javier's uh, is got the lead to this game. Yeah, this but. is definitely uh, looking good here for Javier. It looks like uh, 
Gregor Skrolski oh. is taking. Oh, oh, that's insane. As we were talking, oh, Javier man. found a goose and a paradise rune no for the turn three kidding. Nissa. That is insane. What can Javier do? Also, here turn to three interact? Nissa, apparently. Wow. Well, it would be a turn four down here, right? No, he just found the one spot in time, and he's gonna. He's he has the goose, and he can potentially do it. Yeah. But he didn't uh, want to. Okay, so Paradise Druid comes down here, allowing a Questing Beast next turn. I mean, that's a good way to pressure a turn three Nissa, if anything. Right, right. All right, so Paradise Druid coming down for Gregor's. And then a Deputy top deck here. Deputy's gonna be great. Yeah, de oh. Deputy is always a very nice card. Um, yeah. Not the best target right now necessarily because you might want to just play the Questing Beast. But it's interesting. If you're afraid of turn three Nyssa, this is the only way you can actually interact with this, right? Like, I mean, you go... Right. I mean, I, I kind of like this. You can go Deputy um, with the Hollowed Fountain, take out Gilded Goose, and then next turn you have Nyssa and you'd be for sure the first one to play Nyssa here. That, yeah, that does seem very good. Um, one downside is if he has the Wicked Wolf and he ends up killing his uh, Javier's Paradise Druid, and then you actually can't play the Nissa. Yeah. So it's a pretty tough turn. You can see Javier is actually waiting and, and, and kind of tanking on this turn. Not yeah. sure if he's going to play Questing Beast or Deputy. It's so hard to argue with the turn three Questing Beast, right? Like it's it just is. such a fast clock. It, it is tough, and that's what he's going with. Yeah. Yeah, and even now, I mean, there's some world where you can just kill Nissa. You know, you do have six power in here. This could be a this could be a really important next turn here. I'll yeah. go off the top for uh, Kowalski. You just got to jam Nissa, right? Uh, I think so, but Nissa right here is not actually the most impressive play because you are going to play Nissa and then you're going to not be able to attack and then play Paradise Druid. Mm -hmm. You don't have a Crisis to follow up with, so you don't actually have much to do with all that insane mana that, that it gets you. Yeah, 100%. And Kowalski knows just as well as all of us know that there is a bunch of deputies um, in Javier's main deck and that's all it would take, right? Is just one deputy at attention, target the land, and then you're able to attack Questing Beast to face, and then Paradise Druid to Nissa, and boom, there goes Nissa. Yeah, I can't deputy at attention the land, but you can, oh, questing, yeah, yeah. you can questing Beast, I mean, like, the fact that there's a Nissa in play and the Questing Beast already in Javier's side is problematic for uh, Gregor's Nissa already. Yeah, it's already facing down some, some pressure. Yeah, this will be interesting. And looking like... Kowalski is siding against Nissa here. I, I like this. You're, you're looking to just set up a good board a, a good board stall where you have a decent amount of creatures, so when you play your Nissa, it's gonna be protected. Yeah, oh, yeah. this makes sense. I, yeah. I also do think that Gregorsh would have just played the Nissa if he had a Krasis in his hand. True. But since he doesn't, it's just not as uh, impactful. What do you think of the turning the questing beast into a questing elk here instead of <laughs> making yeah. it a, a creature of the food? Still a legendary elk though. You can't yep. draw another one and, and then just play it. <laughs> that's true, that's true. Okay, so Nissa who shakes the world coming down for Javier. And I mean, if, if I know anything about this format, the first one to get Nissa is heavily advantaged. Correct, yeah. yeah. And also there's two three threes attacking at the Oko straight down yeah. the middle. It's, and now is the question, what do you do here, Shahara? Do you try to protect Oko, or do you save up your your chump blockers, essentially, right now, to be able to protect Nissa next turn, because it is the more powerful Planeswalker in this match? Yeah, I think you I think you chump block, and then you use the, the food to make another 3-3, three, three. so you yeah. can play Nissa, make a 3-3, three, three, and then make another 3-3 three, three with the Oko. So that gives you, instead of chump blocker, potential trade. Yeah. Um, but... Gregor's is not in a good spot here. Yeah, 100%. Um, and I, I think it's great what you said there because if the food is going to have to turn into a 3-3 three, three anyways, you might as well get the Gilded Goose out of there exactly, because it's yeah. not going to produce any mana. So It's not as relevant. Yeah, it, at this point, it's do you want to save an O2 flyer or do you want an Oko? <laughs> and <laughs> yeah. Oko is uh, quite strong here. So this has got to be Nissa who shakes the world from Kowalski coming down here to even the playing field. And, I mean, if... Uh, if Kowalski is able to untap with both Nissa and Oko, you gotta like his chances, right? Well, the problem is Javier just has a giant crisis coming up <laughs> yeah. and a Nissa, uh, more loyalty, plus more 3-3s. Three it's, not, it's not looking good for uh, Gregorsh unless he draws something that's more than just a Paradise Druid. 100%. What, what's uh, Kowalski's best draw here? I mean, with the deputy waiting in the, in the wings with uh, Javier Dominguez as well, this is... 
It seems like it's going to be a tough one. Just two Paradise Druid in hand is not exactly ideal what you want no, right now. No, not at all. I mean, maybe a ma he does have the mass manipulation or the agent. That's true. Though there isn't four blue just yet. In fact, there is one blue since the yeah. found just... Uh, that's interesting though. This, I mean, this absolutely forces Javier Dominguez to make a chump block here. I mean, getting rid of a forest is right. not uh, not as big as getting rid of Nissa here. All right. So what what does Javier do here? Uh, my guess is just a, a large crisis. But let's see what yeah. he does. What Pick, he decides to do. Picks up Paradise Druid here, looking to looking to maybe deploy multiple threats here. Yeah, and he's got somewhat of a free attack here and oh, just to yeah. kill the Nissa. Yeah, I mean, uh, Gregor's Kowalski did put Javier in a bit of a rough spot, forcing that chump lock here, but now the shields are down and mm -hmm. and Javier just gets to take care of as many planeswalkers as he really wants. Yeah. I guess you've got to pick one at this point because he is one short of taking down both. He has eight power with nine loyalty from planeswalkers here. Nissa is just such a more scary card, yeah. though. But uh, yeah, it's it's wow. true that the Nissa is just going to die. The Oko is potentially going to one or just stay at three, and then uh, Paradise Druid will use the mana to make a little bit a bigger crisis. But yep. don't need to have a huge. So oh, he just doesn't want to play the crisis. Okay. Yeah, he I mean, I, I get it. Just a crisis for two here is probably not great. But I mean, look at this. Javier Dominguez is just choking out the mana of Gregor's Kowalski, and. You gotta like his chances this here. This is actually a great play by Javier. The Hallowed Found doesn't tap for mana, so you only yeah. have Temple Garden and two Forest and down Anissa too. So Javier uh, saw the line that just completely annihilates. That is a Gregor's giant hollowed anything. out elk. That's for <laughs> <Yeah>. sure. <laughs> and the nice thing with the Paradise Druid uh, being in play for Javier is it, it's just a great blocker here, right? Or yeah, you don't even have to. Yeah. Niss Nissa at one versus Nissa at seven is usually. Almost no difference whatsoever. No, not not when not when Gregor is at twelve and there's already three threes facing yeah. down. One more three three might just be enough here. Is it is it too soon to call it? No, I don't think it's too soon to call it, but probably uh, an extra yeah. turn or two for Javier to finish Gregor off. Yeah, I would feel that even uh, with what Javier has on the battlefield right now, it's already a very insurmountable uh, um, amount of. Just just raw power on the battlefield. But with Krasis just being able to restock here, this just seems insane. Is this just lethal? Because you can... 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. It is 11. We, we got 11. 11 damage, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so not quite lethal here, but you can see uh, Javier kind of scrolling over the creatures, doing the quick count. A quick lethal check. Just checking, yeah. Got 11. Yeah. <laughs> One thing I want to note that I think is awesome Javier Dominguez may have uh, went against playing Gruel, but look at those sleeves. <laughs> Never fully the gruel leaving Gruel at home. Yeah. All right. So what do you uh, what what would you do here? Well, I think I would potentially. I mean, you just want to be as aggressive as possible. So I think you just want to attack with everything because Javier or uh, Gregor can't actually afford to block anything but a three three. Otherwise, yeah. that's twelve damage. So you can attack with all you want and then potentially play a main phase two mini crisis just to have a flyer on board, yeah. and it's probably going to be a lethal flyer. Yeah, 100%. But blocking this way, um, Javier only will be able to play once upon a time. Which I think is still fine here. Yeah, I mean, it's it's the best block that Gregorish can do, but... So what kind of common... What draw can come off the top here? We, we don't quite have seven mana here for Agent of Treachery, and that's really the card I look to to be able to catch you up in this situation. Nice. Gets the breeding pool, so still gets to play <laughs> yeah, a baby crazy exactly. a baby crazy. Gotta be crazy, right? <laughs> and that's gonna be it. Game one going to Javier Dominguez here, trying to just you know keep his keep his hot streak going. Take, <laughs> take down a mythic championship. Why not take? Doesn't down lose MPL? to Gregorish apparently. One hundred percent. Well played by Javier, though. It was absolutely. I, I really like the the play of being able to uh, take out mana whenever you can. Take right. out a mana creature because then when you cast the first person to cast one of these giant crises is usually the person that's going to be taking it down just because you pull so far ahead with that much value. Um, what do we like here as far as sideboards? Well, I think you're gonna. There's a lot of ways and a lot of uh, things you can do here in the sideboard. Different also on the play and the draw. Yeah, so I just would like to see what uh, These two guys are gonna decide with but I think that <laughs> Gregor wants the time wipe 
and uh, potentially some number of disdainful stroke. Maybe yeah. Vale Summer, but probably not. Interesting, you have interesting. Little... Gregor's chose not to bring in any Veils. Or um, Time Wipe, right? Or Time Wipe, yeah. yeah. Uh, this is, he, he's on the play, so those cards are a little bit more, uh, well, Time Wipe specifically is a, yeah. a little bit more um, control. A little bit more card, reactive, so yeah. Reactive, yeah. And I, I love that, did you see Kowalski's deck name? It was just turn two Oko. Oh, I didn't see that. I didn't <laughs> yeah. that. That's great, though. Just trying to maximize the amount of times that Kowalski gets turn two Oko on. I like it. When I there's like a will. It. There's a way. So, oh, looking at this hand, you have the one drop that accelerates you, which is huge in these matchups, but no green source. So that's a tough one. Yeah. Yep. And uh, uh, Javier makes the discipline mulligan there. I think that's correct. If you, if you don't have... You know, that quick draw when you're on the draw, it, it, it's really easy to fall behind. I think calling it a Discipline Mulligan is exactly on point because it's a hand that you want to keep. It has everything, all the pieces you want, and you're just, just a little bit too, a, a turn too slow with the tap land, Fable Passage being the green mana you have. Exactly, yep, exactly. Okay, so let's check out the hand from Kowalski up there. That's a, that's a decent amount of forest here. Keeping Nissa on top, though, is good, but I don't know, do you like that hand? I mean, Gregor Shan is not looking great here, but he does have either Gust, which can potentially slow down Javier's uh, Javier's start, and then yeah. Wicked Wolf potentially too to slow down. Nissa is a pretty good. It's a, apparently it's going to be a, maybe a five, yeah. a turn five play, which is not what you want to be doing, but not sometimes. Ideal. Sometimes you have to. But, I mean, you know, one play pattern that comes up a lot in these pseudo-mirror matches mm -hmm. is, you know, going for turn two Oko. And while Kowalski settles with the fact that, okay, I may not have turn two Oko, but I want to deprive you from having turn two Oko. Right. And when you have Gilded Goose and you have to sacrifice your food to get that Oko into play, if you can put that even on top, you deprive a mana, it's essentially a time walk there. Right, which it is, is very, pretty very sweet. good. Yeah. Oh, that, that was honestly a very huge draw there. Just nothing to play on turn three from Kowalski. is it, It's very scary in these kind of positions. So going from Javier Dominguez here, also looks like it might just be a, a, a send back here. Yeah, can't play Wicked Wolf. I don't even know if you would want to in this situation. No, you, you probably just want to hold the Wicked Wolf. Um, yeah. But Kowalski can play his own Wicked Wolf now, which and yeah. just kills the Gilded Goose. Yeah. Now, uh... Javier didn't do anything last turn, so he could potentially have Disdainful Stroke or Aether Gust or any, any kind of reactive spell oh, yeah. that Gregorsh might be playing around here. Yeah, I mean, uh, Javier has access to three Disdainful Strokes, Negate, and an Aether Gust. There's a lot to be afraid of, and, and look at this. Gregor Kowalski respects... Oh, yeah, respects the fact that a Disdainful Stroke could be there, and, and just plays Oko. Yeah, he decides to play around the one potential mystical dispute. Might not even be in the deck, but yeah. there is one mystical dispute, and it just snap resolves. So, yeah, I don't know. I what do you what do you think about that? Because I think the safe play, um, you know, is, is not the most high impact play. But I guess I do like this. This still shuts off the Nissa, which is the main thing. It here. does. Yeah. I mean, one of the problems with the Wicked Wolf is that if he gets countered and then there is a Nissa, you're screwed. Oh, right. look at oh that yeah, that's, draw. That's a disgusting Best possible? Here. Yeah, probably the best possible draw. It has to be. <laughs> Maybe an untap land would have been as well, but... Well, Kowalski getting a little punished here for not going with the Wicked Wolf to just cleanly answer Gilded Goose because that food attacking into a Wicked Wolf, well, it's good. It doesn't right. take down a Planeswalker. But here comes Nissa who shakes the world from Kowalski here trying to strike back. And oh no, the land off the top is going to lead to an insane play here from Javier Dominguez. I don't see how you don't just snap off. Uh... You have to play the Wicked Wolf, and then you kill the Temple of Mastery oh. land, and then you just make the Oko, uh, sorry, make the food of 3 3 and kill the Nissa. Seems like what you would want to do here. Uh, since you can't, you don't have five mana, you can't play the Nissa just yet. Yeah. I mean, I mean on. Chooses to use the food. I, I kind of thought uh, Javier would do this. Chooses to use the food to just deal with Temple of right. uh, Mystery because six power is already on the board. Yeah, and then you yeah. just kill the Nissa. Oh no. 
I honestly, probably two of the best possible draws from Javier back to back there. Land four plus Oko just really flipped the switch on this. Yeah, this, this, this game has certainly turned around. Land five from Kowalski here, which is gonna be really important if he wants to deploy that, uh, um, deploy that uh, second Nissa here, but at this point, that Nissa almost has no chance of living. Yeah, I mean, there's just too many three threes to deal with. Now a four four with Wicked Wolf, and potentially if Javier draws a land, he gets a Nissa as well. Yeah. So. Uh, but what else would you do here? Gregor is, is in trouble, especially because he did, doesn't have time wipe nor any white mana. Yeah. So. But I mean, you said it right. I I think I agree with uh, Kowalski's choice to not bring him in when you're when you're going first. You just want to maximize your really powerful draws in the form of turn two Oko or turn three Nissa. Yeah. And if you're just drawing time wipe off the top when you really need that fifth land, like that feels real bad. It makes sense to yeah. not bring that in. Um, it's just when you fall behind, it's just that much worse for you. Yeah. You just can't afford to fall behind, which uh, Gregor did. It definitely he did. So Kowalski runs out the second Nissa who shakes the world and is able to attack freely here, but Oko at four. Yeah, Oko at four. That's <laughs> quite relevant. Yeah. Oh, and a Temple Garden off the top here is just going to mean that th uh, Javier Dominguez just has access to so much mana this turn. Yeah, he can kind of do it all here. Oh, yeah. Here comes Nissa. Could also maybe, potentially, you might see Javier just choose to ignore the Nissa and just go face. And just go but face? Maybe not, because there's a crisis, you know? The, yeah. If it was an Oko, maybe you'd want to ignore it, but if there's a Nissa, you probably don't want to. I, I like that. I like that just dealing with the card that is the most problematic and really the only way that uh, Kowalski can fight back into this game right. with Hydrate Crisis. This way, I mean, you're constraining your uh, your opponent down to just five land, maybe six if they top deck. And Hydroid Crisis for four lines up quite well against all these three threes uh, from Oko and Nissa. But when there's a ton of them, right. it, it gets to be a lot harder here. And uh, Javier opted not to use the Oko main phase one to maybe attack with the food. I think he's planning on making the Grazer a three three. Oh, and then yeah. the next turn making the food. So that's just two more three threes. Grazing out coming down here. And Agent of Treachery would have been insane. You know, we mentioned this uh, at the pregame, how this card's so important, and Javier just doesn't have access to these type of cards, but this is no longer on the battlefield. This is no longer an option. I mean, there's just five, or four three threes, a four four, and a potential, potentially two more three threes facing down uh, Kowalski. So his Agent of Treachery is not gonna be enough, especially when you can't cast it. No, so. I mean, having having two active Planeswalkers here against zero without any of these uh, Time Wipe yeah. slash Wrath of God effects, I just, I, I think if we stack both players' decks, where Javier Dominguez only draws lands and Kowalski just draws gas, and I don't, I don't think it's gonna be enough. No, I mean, I think the game is, uh, yeah just about called at this point. Yep. He played Wicked Wolf to trade with the land <laughs> and then killed the Oko. Yeah. But a bunch of 3-3s three and an Nissa in play, plus a Krasis. Yeah, what, what, a, what a world, what a time to be alive when Wicked Wolf is trading for a Grazer, right? Correct. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so looks like Javier putting the finishing touches on this. Very likely to uh, advance here and uh, play against Huey next yep. round. Yep. That's exciting. All right. Krasis comes down here for four, and there's the good game. Play against, the play against Autumn. Oh, play against, no, I believe it's uh, Huey. Huey lost, so this is the lower division going That's up. That's right, we're yeah. still in the lower division, so <laughs> oh, congrats to Javier there. Like he needs more congrats in his yeah. life. <laughs> so that does mean that Kowalski is out for this, but you know, he got some good mythic points in and a uh, well played match there. Didn't get his first win against Javier. Oh, Dang it, huh? Tough. Well, <laughs> we do have an interview from Javier, so let's see what he had to say after this particular win. Welcome everybody, I am Paul Chian, joined here by the man who simply refuses to lose in the game of Magic, Javier Dominguez. How's it going? Oh, pretty well. Uh, <laughs> I hope the refusing to lose thing, you know, goes longer. <laughs> You, of course, just won Mythic Championship 5 in Long Beach, and then you flew straight home. Like, what ha what happened? What was the turnaround time for you to play in this event? It was like land, sleep, wake up, and play. So as simple as that. <laughs> <laughs> so you didn't really have a lot of time to prepare for this. And, I mean, you literally just won $100,000 playing Gruel Beatdowns. 
What made you switch? Well, that's a good question. I think Gruel was fine for the MC because there was a lot of Golos. But for this split, I expected less Golos. So I just asked my friends, well, what do you, th what do you think is good? What do you think is like the best egg for the split? And they were like, and food for sure. And that's what I run. I just run pretty much the Marcia and Andrea deck list with a little bit uh, small tweaks. They actually told me it make, uh, make some sense. So here I am. I don't have that much experience with the with the deck list, but you know it's going well. So <laughs> it's going well so far. I mean, I imagine you've already had plenty of experience playing against the deck and maybe a little bit with the deck, right? Because it sounded like most of the team was pretty set on playing this deck at the Mythic Championship, and you kind of woke up and switched last minute. Yeah, I was going to play Golos, so that's the deck I played the most. But I also played, you know, my, my fair share of like Oko decks because at least I wanted to be, I wanted to know like how to beat them, sort of. So yeah, I'm gonna use that practice to to play, try to play better in the split. So you know, that was actually the match that you just played it was one of the fastest matches that I've ever seen between kind of like the Bant Mirror. Now, you know, uh, are are there some like keys to kind of the Bant matchup? that kind of really helps you decide who's going to win quickly or at, like something that lets you know that, all right, I, I'm pretty sure I got this. Well, if you like untap with like two place walkers and they don't have any place walkers, things are, you know, going well for you. So it's, you cannot try to get to a point where you're the one with the place walkers because that, that's, I think that's the most important thing in the matchup. So you are slated to go up against William Huey Jensen in the next round. Now, both of you, apparently refuses to lose because he also top-aided the last Mythic Championship. What are your thoughts about maybe some of the key elements to kind of your matchup coming up? Well, the matchup is pretty much a mirror match. Like, I think we play very similar deck lists. Um, and while he is obviously a great player and um, always a tough opponent, he actually also beat me in the in the first step of the split. And to be fair, I'm pretty sure he played this a lot for the MC where he played like the uh, similar foot deck. So I think I'm probably slightly behind in terms of like win percentage because I'm pretty sure he has more experience than I do in the mirror match. Uh, so yeah, I think that's that's my read here because I know I probably have played the matchup less than him. So that, that's how I see it. But well, I still have to try my best. Yeah, I, I mean, trying your best uh, was was good enough for uh, for Mythic Championship. So let's see if you can uh, keep it going uh, for this event. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> All right, best of luck next round. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Paul. All right, well, Javier Dominguez, number one in Mythic points right now, but he just got two more right there in that That's match. Right. Easy game, huh? <laughs> okay, so looking forward to what we just saw, Dominguez and Kowalski, they've played each other at Worlds before, haven't they? Yep, last year, that was uh, the finals. That well, was the finals, yep. Uh, how 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 many other players here today have have been world champions and played in worlds? Hmm. I believe the <laughs> next match we're going to see was the year before Worlds <laughs> finals match. So like. Javier's just there every year, it seems. Yeah, so. <laughs> I mean, you can't get rid of him. This guy just keeps winning. Yeah, and keeps thinking he's behind. If you notice in all of his winners, he's just like, ah, oh, think of a dog this round, but Well, at least we this time, Billy did, Huey did win and beat Javier, so he was actually, in fact, behind. Okay, That's true. so you're That's one true. of the few that calls William Huey Jensen Billy. Would <laughs> yeah. that be because he's your roommate? Correct. <laughs> <laughs> That's for real. You're time. in the inside <laughs> circle. You got a nickname above the nickname. Yeah, exactly. yeah. That's, uh -huh. that's the next level of friendship right okay. there, yeah. So does that mean you have a favorite in this next match? Absolutely. Uh, I'm, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not afraid to admit that I'm a bit biased here. I absolutely want Huey to win, so it's going to be uh, pretty sweet. So you yeah. can wiggle your magic fingers. It seems like Javier thinks Huey does have a little edge uh, having tested this particular deck a little more. So yeah. we'll see what happens. And but sitting across from Huey is just terrifying all the time. <laughs> like, I'm on the same testing team, you know, we both are. And every time I play against Huey, it's just terrifying. You know, I, I just I just never win. He looks in my soul, you know. He really does. He has those eyes that just penetrate. 100%, 100%. All right. Well, we'll find out what happens in this next match in a little bit. But right now we have a break for you. And we'll be coming back with more magic. Welcome back to MTL Those are so Weekly. Hard. Oh hard. yeah. Well, not everybody gets to see the name the card slides. They might see Twitch ads, so you're making them feel left out. I'm Becca Scott here with Marshall Sutcliffe Sorry about that. and Jahar Shinhar. We can talk about it. We can, you know, they should probably subscribe we, we and then they like, get to name the card. Plummet, d destroy a flying creature. It's <laughs> like a bell hunt. And then it was like just a post bell. <laughs> it's like, all right, never mind. When you already knew it was a sorcery. Oh, no. Silly, silly. Oh my goodness. Well, welcome back, Marshall. Also, just want to say, Shahar. 
Excellent casting. I know Thank you. Uh, you're pretty new at the casting side. Yeah, first time casting. Uh, it's been fun so first far. First time playing Magic. Exactly. No. Mm -hmm. You've you. been doing that for a little while. It's my first time <laughs> casting too. How am I doing? Um, shut up. You know you're amazing. <laughs> Get out of first here. Time casting <laughs> yeah, that's true. This is going to be fun. Oh, oh man. I'm Watch excited. out, world. Let's do it. Absolutely. Let's take a look at our bracket so far on this lovely Saturday. So, we are about to watch the lower finals. We've already seen the upper finals where Autumn Burchette had a 2 0 win against Jensen, sending him down to the lower finals. And then we just watched Dominguez, a lot of 2 0 so far today against Kowalski, Kowalski with uh, Bant Ramp versus Bant Food. Now we're going to see Bant Food almost a mirror. It's a mirror. Yeah. Mirror. Is it exactly a mirror? Let's see. No. No, no, no. There's very close. There's some, I just feel bad for Huey. Because Javier <laughs> forgot how to lose. He like, really that did. dude hasn't lost a match in forever. Every time he's on my screen, it's like, yeah, well, Javier wins again. Yeah, he yeah. is on absolute fire. Yeah. I think some people are a little uh, cursed when they're the featured match at some events, and uh, Javier is quite the opposite. Yeah, it he, always he seems to go blessed. in his favor. Yeah, the, the pressure works well for him. Looks good on him. Uh, but he thinks Huey's a little bit favored because he played a not quite bant food, but simic food in the Mythic Championship 5, so play tested more. Uh, right. So what do you think, obviously? Uh, well, I mean, Huey is a fantastic player, one of the best in the world, and then there's Javier, who is on fire <laughs> and also is playing completely out of his mind. Every time I watch him, he's just so good right now. Uh, it's going to be a really fun match. That's yeah. what I'm going to say. I don't know who's going to win. I'm hoping Huey, but it's going to be a fun match. These yeah. guys have quite a history, too. Yeah. Huey, do, Hall of Famer. Yeah, yeah, and they also played against each other in the finals of the World Championship. Sure, Corey was just reminding us of that as yeah, well. Sure. So, ooh, a bit of a blood rematch. Match, yeah. yeah, let's see if blood will be spilled, and let's get into this match. All right, Shahar, let's get in here. It looks like we're going to be riding along with Javier on the bottom part of our screen. He's got a four land opener. No ramp to speak of here. This might be a mulligan. Yeah, turn three deputy is not gonna get right. the job done. No paradise druid, no goose, not even a once upon a time to potentially find one of those. And he's gonna send it back. So this one looks a little better. He does have the druid into a wicked wolf. How important is wicked wolf gonna be in this type of matchup? Uh, it is an absolute great card, but it's not what you wanna be doing uh, if you don't have like a Nissa or an Oko to also put the pressure on. I see. Currently no food production either for Javier, so he's gonna have to try to find something in between here, but at least he has the two drop in to four drop on turn three here. Though Jensen also mulliganing to six, he's found a Gilded Goose to kick things off as well as a Leafkin Druid at the minimum. Yeah, the, 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 uh, the fact that ha Huey drew Goose and Leafkin Druid mm -hmm. is gonna really pair well for uh, Javier with the two Wicked Wolves, because he uh -huh. also doesn't have like an Oko right now, so he's just gonna play some ramp cards. Yeah, now this actually worked out well because Jensen ended up finding Paradise Druid, which he can of course not let it die yeah, thanks to the protect it by just not attacking. And look, this worked out nicely here as well. It did. A questing beast off the top of the library. He could just slam that on the battlefield and get to get to Bastion if he'd like. Yeah, and the Wicked Wolf is actually not that good against Questing Beast if there is no food. It's just a 3-3. Three, three. So right. right now, it's just gonna kill a Paradise Druid and not do much else at the yeah. moment. And you know, when you're facing down a Wicked Wolf, that's about the best you can hope for, because that right. card does work in this matchup. There's Questing Beast, though, once again at the ready. It's gonna have taken eight life from Javier just out of these last two turns, already doing good work on the battlefield, and Javier still doesn't have a clean answer for the beast yet. Yeah, if Javier draws like a Goose or maybe just an Oko, it might, uh, it might be good for him then, but right now, the Wolf is just a 3-3. And as we typically see in matchups like this, the players will tend to use any form of removal they have to attack the opposing player's mana. Yeah. Even yeah. though, you know, he could have aimed something else. Right, Huey was just scared of a uh, Nissa on a turn four Nissa, and also deputy detentioning a Wicked Wolf is a bit is a bit scary. Once you kill the deputy, you get the Wicked Wolf back. You get all that enter the battlefield. No one wants that. And of course, the deputy of detention quite vulnerable to even just a bare Wicked Wolf of itself. And we'll probably see something like that here, though. You know, you look at the at the lines of play here available for Javier and. It, no matter how he does it, it doesn't end up great for him still facing down the Questing Beast. Yeah, I mean, he either takes four or double blocks to deal with the Questing Beast. Oof, I can't even which, imagine yeah, that. Double blocking with two <laughs> Wicked Wolves oh. that are usually indestructible feels, feels bad. But Huey doesn't have 
and didn't have any cards in hand and doesn't have a crisis or anything really crazy to follow up with like a Nissa or a crisis, so. Yeah. Okay, wow, now that. here's, this is, is this a little too late is the question. The Gilded Goose comes down and gives a food token. He can use that to stabilize. Yeah, I, I actually don't think this is uh, too late. Mm -hmm. um, you already get one. Go you already get one food. That's already. That already means the questing beast can't attack into the wicked wolf, and then the goose is gonna keep making foods. Uh, if Huey doesn't find an answer. And really smart here from Javier, he also recognizes, hey, I've got a free attack here yeah. on my own. Oh, but Deputy oh. of Detention that for is William Huey Jensen off the top of the draw. library. That's what he wanted to see. Get those wicked wolves out the way. Ooh, that's a nice clean top deck there. Ooh. Not only does it take away the only potential block for this questing beast, but it gets rid of the other wicked wolf as well, clearing the way for an all out attack here from yeah. Jensen. Yeah, Javier goes to two life here with, with a food token and potentially another food off the goose, but he doesn't really have much else to do on his turn. He's deciding if he'd like to make a food or sacrifice a food, but <laughs> Right now, it's a real mana question, and a land off the top is not gonna get the job done here. Javier is in desperation mode. He can gain six life this turn. One, two, one, two, sorry, he can't actually. Yeah, if he had played the forest, he would have been able to gain six, but yeah. I think Javier at this point knows that he's just kind of packing it in. Uh, doesn't really, like even if he draws a Krasis off the top or a Nissa, yeah, he's not even waiting for blocks. He's just because there's no outs. Correct. Yeah. yeah. And and we mentioned this um, earlier in the day, Shahar, but we do see this play pattern come up quite often. That when a player falls significantly behind in a matchup like this, there are precious few ways to claw back in, and from that position, really none. Yeah. I mean, there's time wipe that uh, Gregor has in his in mm. his 75, but mm -hmm. other than that, there's mass manipulation. If you really have a ton of mana, but in general, it's very very difficult to come back from that kind of board position. Boy, deputy detention. That huh? was a good one. That was a nice rip there for Jensen, right when he needed it most. He was probably pumping his fist saying, thank God I didn't play Simic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Giving Lyra a treat. <laughs> exactly. Shahar, Starbucks on me tonight, buddy. <laughs> All right, looks like we've got some uh, sideboard action here. As you see the disdainful stroke in hand here. Yeah, for, I mean this. Uh, this hand is uh, is okay. He's got the Paradise Druid for turn two, and then he can ramp into Nissa. He also has the Breeding Pool, which is a very important land when you have Nissa plus disdainful stroke. Ah, uh, sure, sure. It but, looks like Jensen's going to mulligan once again, down to six cards. But this time he has the signature opener for the deck. He has Goose into Oko. Turn two Oko into turn three Wicked Wolf. That is very strong. Wow. Super powerful stuff, and you can see why this is powerful. I mean, if you've been watching Standard, you already know that, but this sort of illustrates why there's just not great ways here uh, for Javier to combat this. He even has to turn to Paradise Druid, but Oko's loyalty is laughably big. <laughs> even yeah, this early, loyalty. already at six. Oh, yeah. we could have dueling Okos here. How important is it to be the first one with Oko on the battlefield? Uh, it is quite important if you're also able to follow up with uh, Wicked Wolf or Anissa. Mm. But if you kind of just don't have anything else, like if you're a little flooding, it's not as impactful. The fact that there's an Oko on the battlefield for Javier is very, very good. And the Paradise Druid is in play untapped, so it won't die to the Wicked Wolf. Huey doesn't really have a great turn here. Jensen surveying the scene now, trying to figure out what the best plan of action is. Both players with very similar board states, Mana Rampers and Okos, plus a food token each. It looks like Jensen's gonna get aggressive here. He's gonna wake up that food token and uh, send it in at the opposing Oko. Yeah, and not, not playing the turn. Wicked Wolf because he had to get rid of his food to actually make a 3-3. Three, three. So it was a pretty awkward turn for Huey, but he can still make a food token end of turn and have uh, excess mana. Now, how much does Javier have to think about counter spells from Jensen? Because he's now staring across Island Forest Forest and maybe a Gilded Goose activation. Right. But if you look at his hand, he's got Nissa who shakes the world in hand. Yeah, and uh, Javi Huey is up a game, which means that he was on the draw. Mm -hmm. It is more likely that he's gonna have counter spells on the draw than on the play. Um, you know, it, everybody has a di different approach to the matchup and some people bring in counter spells. I know Manguchi barely even cyborgs in the matchup, 
So we'll see if Javier is going to decide to play around it. That's the big question because, look, if Javier just gets kind of bold here and runs out Nissa who shakes the world, he can be in commanding position here because of the play that you outlined earlier where he can untap a breeding pool and have disdainful stroke ready to protect Nissa. Let's see if he goes for it. I think he's going oh, for he's it. Oh, he's going to go for he's it. He's going for it. And it's going to work. Jensen can simply yeah. say, you got it. Nissa resolves, and with that breeding pool untapped and disdainful stroke at the ready, he can start applying big time pressure to Oko while protecting his own board state here. Wow, that was a big play there from that Javier. Was huge. The question and is, do you go for it or not? Ultimately, he decided, I'm doing it, and it worked. It did, in fact. Whew. One thing to note is that if, if uh, Huey did have the counter spell, he wouldn't be able to make a food off the goose. So maybe that was a deciding factor for Javier, saying, all right, if you have the counter spell, at least you won't be able to make a food plus a 3-3 three, three uh. off the Oko and attack me. Um, still has five mana because the Oko is alive, but it's not, it's not as bad. So end step after Oko, by the way, took six damage there down to one loyalty. Jensen's going to make a Gilded Goose, and then his draw for the turn? Oh, it's another Hydroid Crisis. Is that what he wants to see? Mm, no, not so no it's not. Not when there's a Disdainful Stroke and a Crisis coming on the next turn. Right. Yeah, this is lining up beautifully here for Javier. The upside of going for that Nissa was so high, and now he gets to realize it after it worked. Yeah, no, it's, it's huge here. Because now he gets to untap with Nissa who shakes the world. And an Elko. <laughs> Oh no. Actually, will he lose Nissa here? Yes, he will. He will lose Nissa, but he will continue having an Oko. Okay, well, and, that's not uh, the end of the world from Huey's right. perspective. Right, and this right. is also a trade of, of uh, Planeswalkers because Huey had to attack with two 3 threes, so now the Oko is gonna kill, is gonna die for Huey. I see. It's funny because this that play, uh, the, the Nissa who shakes the world last turn from Javier has just sent sort of shockwaves through this game, mm -hmm. which are still resolving. Because as you can see, Jensen's about to lose his Oko as a result of needing to take down Nissa, and he did. He right. had to attack Nissa there. Yeah, he, he gets to kill the Oko here and attack for six, putting uh, Huey at 12 with three three threes and a Wicked Wolf, plus still an Oko in play. Mm -hmm. So can't really attack with those three threes into the Wicked Wolf. Huey's in trouble. He was in big trouble here. He does find Nessa who shakes the world, and he has a temple garden. Is it too late is the question. Uh, it's looking like it's very close to being too late, but we'll see if Huey finds a way to uh, manage to come back here. Yeah, because, you know, you could at least imagine a scenario where he plays Nissa, somehow survives and keeps Nissa alive, and then just goes crasis, crasis. Right, I mean, he does have blockers. Yeah. And uh, if Javier plays a crasis and then just draws a lot of lands or a lot of uh, nothing, then Huey has two crasis and four forests in play in an island, so that's a lot of mana. He's gonna wake up one of those forests. And, uh, Fabled Passage is a draw step here, Shahar. Yeah, that's Not that's great. a start for Huey. Jensen needs a few things to go right in a row here to get himself back into this game, and that was stage one. Yep, absolutely. Now, the fact that Javier is no longer, uh, there's no longer a Nissa for Javier. Mm -hmm. So Huey does have the Nissa advantage, which sometimes can get back, you can come back from, uh, you know, when you're quite behind. That is one of the ways. That's right. So we're gonna see a crisis for four here, which will allow Javier to keep that breeding pool up and ready to attack. And he found two lands two off lands. of it. All hey, right. that was stage two of what needs to yeah. happen for Jensen to get back into this thing. Some silver lining on the crisis for four. Well, the three three is getting stolen by the 3-3 uh, the three, three lane is getting stolen, so that's not great for uh, Huey because that just took away a blocker as well, and it just, it's, it's another 3-3 three, three attacker, so. See how aggressive uh, Javier wants to be at Huey's life total or the Nissa. Looks like he's going all face. I think that's what Huey wants to see, right? I think so. Because if he gets to untap and play a huge crisis, that could help. Well, he might want to see just a couple attacks on the Nissa, uh, and then oh. just 
because because Nissa just needs to survive. It doesn't have to have a lot of loyalty. One loyalty. Nissa one. one. Yeah. yeah, that's all. He, I mean, one isn't really going to be that possible, but Nissa three yeah. is going to be just as good. So. No, that's a good point, and that lets Jensen keep his life total as intact as possible. Yeah. And it looks like at the end, Javier decided that Food Token and Wicked Wolf are going to go just both face. at Jensen. Yeah. So Jensen can take three or maybe four here. Taking four is a bit, or taking six is a bit greedy here because then there's a crisis that's just lethal. Mm. Huey's going to be at four life. Crisis is a four four flyer. So I think taking the one trade and then, oh, it looks like he is maybe also chumping, which is totally reasonable. Yeah, he just doesn't want to let his life total get too low here when. I mean, he's got to figure that if this game goes for three or four more turns, he could turn this thing around with those two copies of Hydra Crisis and then this on the battlefield. There's once a, a once upon, upon a time. time. Mm -hmm. I mean, that don't that, you just want to find Crisis anyway? So well, maybe Deputy Detention, but at ah. this point, it seems like you just want to play a Crisis and uh, just try to survive. Yeah, try to go Crisis land once upon a time, yeah. like. Get a forest or something. Yeah, you haven't played a land for turn, so if you play a, a pretty big crisis, that's going to be big enough to uh, either block the crisis, his uh, Javier's crisis, or just not, or, or just be able to trump the wicked wolf that's currently big and indestructible. So we'll see what Huey decides to do here, but it seems like, yeah. Go big or go home, says William Huey Jensen. He's going to play six. a crisis for six. Ooh. And he did find a land, though it is just an island, although I do see Mystical Dispute. Yeah, and that is enough because he cards. hasn't used Nissa yet. Yeah, that's right. So this actually worked out really well for him. He can once upon a time and keep up Mystical Absolutely Dispute. Absolutely, it did. Oh, that's another <laughs> and land. another All land. Right, what is going on here? We are cooking with some gas. So huh. what can uh, Javier do here? What's his best play? Can't just make a leave a six six crisis flying, right? Because you, then you mm -hmm. are in trouble since the your crisis can't attack. Maybe you can Oko and just make a nine nine elk, and then have a wicked wolf that's indestructible to kind of stop and then and try to just beat, hope that that crisis just is there. try to stall the ground and beat with the flyer. Wow, that's what he's doing, Shahar. He's gonna. Whoa. Maybe not. Maybe not. <laughs> the big pump fake here. He heard me. He did, yeah. Uh, on Tuesday or whatever. <laughs> God, this has been fascinating because, you know, again, when you're sitting in Jensen's seat, you have to make certain assumptions when you get as far behind as he did. Yeah. And some of those assumptions involve your opponent not drawing rele relevant cards. And that's exactly what happened. The last three cards off the top of the library from uh, Javier have been bricks, all of them. Yeah, absolutely. I think at one point Huey just goes, all right, I can't beat anything that Javier could have in his hand or potentially top deck. I'm just gonna have to play in a way that he won't have that. Um, but to Javier's credit, he slammed the Nissan turn four and didn't get punished. Yeah, so. that's true. We'll see what Once Upon a Time gets here. Maybe a deputy of detention to really seal the deal here. Huey doesn't really need a third crisis, just a forest. Jensen thinking over what he wants to do now, but another forest on the battlefield equals two more mana for him, and uh, all Javier can do is just sort of shuffle around with those two lands in his hand. He just has nothing. Yeah, I think uh, I Jensen mean, Jensen's is just in a good spot. Great now. spot. He yeah. has a giant crisis and potentially disdainful choke plus dispute, and uh, pretty obvious that Javier doesn't really have much going on since he's been playing top lands for the last two turns and haven't done anything else. Mm -hmm. So, Huey's just trying to play around a, a potential great top deck. Here comes a big Hydroid Crisis. This one's going to be an 8-8 natural. And look at that hand now for Jensen. It's a lot of gas. Whew. He has already played his land for the turn, but still. But there's a Paradise Truid untapped. Right. And there's a potential island to be untapped with the Nissa, which is just what he needs to mana for Disdainful Stroke or Once Upon a Time. 
Looks like he's gonna keep the option on Mystical Dispute as well here. He'll have three mana available. And he can just simply pass yep. the turn back after this attack with this massive 9-9 nine -nine Krasis. Now remember, this one's on the ground and doesn't have Trample, so this Wicked Wolf can deal with it. Yeah, this gets rid of a food token, um, but I think Huey only makes this attack because he's not scared of an attack back from Javier. So, so it's, it's free. For him, he's just like, all right, I'm getting rid of a food token. Um, and I think he's right because Javier can't attack with too many creatures since mm -hmm. there's a 9-9 nine -nine in play and a lot of 3-3s three and an 8-8 eight -eight flyer. It's, Javier's in trouble now. There's an 11-11. Finally, Nissa will go away here. The Hydroid Krasis can attack Nissa to zero loyalty, but boy, the damage has been done. Jensen gets to sit here and <laughs> as he untaps, he'll have seven cards in his hand with a draw step coming. And this was from a player who was very much on the ropes just a few turns ago. Yeah, and now there is no there is no food, so these crisis are going to hit hard, really hard. Very hard. This board state is going to crumble quickly here, and William Huey Jensen looks poised to win a quick two-gamer here against Javier. Dang. Yeah, this game... That escalated quickly. Huey really turned this game around. Mm-hmm. But I don't think Javier is going to be able to turn, turn it back. Not, not anymore. A little bit uh, too far behind. Maybe if there was a time wipe, but also no disdainful strokes. Right, and so, there's, yeah, there's to be just a little two bit. Two for Jensen? It's like he's got insurance plans for his insurance plans here. I yeah. think he's in good shape. And as you mentioned before, the two copies of Hydroid Crisis are massive on the ground, and with no real defense left here for Dominguez, he's going to be left just uh, going for chump blocks or maybe a triple block or just some nonsense that's going to leave him with no just, board. Yeah, whatever it is, it's not going to be good. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, take, take nine once, but he can't do that again because now he's at seven. They're both lethal, yeah. And it looks like he may be poising up a good game here, checking out the hand here of Jensen with just the forest left. Jensen's gonna have so many cards available, and he can basically just do whatever he wants at this point. And he just passes the turn back. But as we mentioned before, you know, the last five cards off the top of the library for Dominguez were all lands and paradise druids. And he needed yeah. he needed to run really well after that Hydrate Crisis missed with the three lands or the two lands. Now all he can do is make food tokens and paradise druids, and Jensen knows that he's got this one all but locked up. Just about. Dominguez flirting with the good game button on <laughs> yeah, his last turn. Dominguez but he was like, oh, said, you know, let's make this it, guy earn it. Do we do know? it now? Do we do it later? Do yeah. we wait a second? But yeah, it is absolutely over at this point. Yep. Uh, and there it Marshall, is. you could call game. it. Yeah, and that's good game for <laughs> Javier Dominguez. Scooping him up to William right. Huey Jensen. Awesome. And uh, wow. All that right. was a serious comeback. You don't get to see that all the time because the players have to decide pretty early when they're too far behind and what needs to happen to get them back. And no matter how unlikely that is, take that line. And we saw Huey do a version of that yep. where it was not impossible, but he needed uh, things to go well for him and poorly for Javier, and both happened. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, impressive nonetheless, uh, even though it was a lot of lands off the top for Javier. Yeah, part of the uh, equation. Yep. But absolutely, that's part of what happened. So let's see what Huey had to say about this match win. Okay, I am here with William Huey Jensen, winner of the lower division. How's it going, Huey? Going all right. I'm glad to uh, have another shot at it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, you've made it pretty deep in, uh, in several of these. And, uh, of course, uh, coming fresh off your top eight at Mythic Championship 5. I have a quick question. You know, you had success in that event playing Simic Food, and of course, the vast majority of your teammates also played Simic Food. And coming into this event, why did you choose to splash the white and go into Bant? Basically, I thought, and my teammates thought, and I think also the math thought, I'm a very big fan of what the math thinks, that um, Bant Food was a favorite over Simic Food. 
I also thought that Simic Food preyed on decks that would attempt to prey on Golos, and I didn't expect those decks to show up in this in this eight-person split. I expected a lot of Bant and a little Golos, and pretty much that's exactly what happened. And question, you know, kind of going into, of course, last week's tournament, the, the deck with the big target on its back was, of course, the Bant Golos deck. Uh, and, you know, a lot of people chose to play the food deck. Does that mean that you feel that the food deck actually matches up pretty fine against the, the various Golos decks? I think so. I mean, I thought our deck was even better because we had the four copies of main deck Disdainful Stroke, <clears throat> which is basically for that matchup. Um, we also had four Questing Beasts, where some of the food decks didn't. Uh, you know, I liked our matchup. I think that the, the Field of the Dead Golos deck is obviously a great deck, an absurd strategy, and once it gets going, you can't really interact. But it also, I think, has uh, the characteristic of a deck where oftentimes when you're losing, you're losing for a long time. So it feels like you're losing more often. And it has some really clunky draws. And, uh, you know, like cards like Questing Beast and Nissa, they really take advantage of clunky draws. You don't have time to, to stumble. Um, so often a well-timed counter would be able to win. Uh, the interesting thing to me was I looked at some statistics about the MC and Bant Food did better against Golos than Simic Food. So given that, uh, deputy detention, a well-timed deputy detention, detention, still very strong against a horde of zombies. So I was more than happy to play Bant Food and not lose the edge in the mirror. Now, do you think anything changes? Because you are, of course, going up against Autumn Burchett in the finals, and they're bringing a slightly different twist to the the Golos deck. You know, they're not playing the typical Bant Golos deck, but they're playing the kind of the Fires of Invention shell, which could lead to more explosive draws. Do you think that is a worse or better matchup than your traditional Bant Golos decks? So I think with the Bant food, you would rather play against non-fires Golos, where with Simic, I thought the other way, because often if you could just disdainful stroke the fires, they would have so much clunk, like <laughs> Fae of Wishes and things like that. They couldn't cast their spells. So um, I would rather be playing Simic now, but for the field, I think Bant was better. This, of course, is going to be the last week that we will see Field of the Dead being played in Standard. And, uh, you know, of course, this was also in part due to the fact that uh, many of you did not really have time to, of course, prepare for uh, this week's event because you were fresh off of Mythic Championship 5. Sure. Now, now, with kind of the banning of Field of the Dead and just looking at Standard moving forward, I mean, is this banned food deck just clearly the number one deck in the format? Well, the way I see it is Golos had a target on its back before the banning. And not only did the target move, but it got bigger. So um, I guess the answer to your question is yes. I'm not sure what people are going to do exactly yet. I've been focusing on this split, so I haven't been playing new standard yet. But uh, I think things are going to get kind of extreme and people trying to fight the Oko Nissa decks. Yeah, yeah. I've seen a lot of people running main deck copies of uh, Noxious Grass yeah. as a way to Sounds start. Sounds reasonable. So. <laughs> All right. Well, it looks like you have a big match ahead of you. So best of luck in your match against Autumn Burchett. Thank you very much. All right. We heard Huey there, and he's going to go up once again against Autumn Burchett. And uh, really depends on uh, those opening hands, right? Yeah. I mean, he beat her the, the first round, and hopefully he's going to beat her this time. He did lose to her uh, earlier, but, you know, he's won one so far, so... Hopefully he's got this. Yeah, well, you know, it seems, uh, what do you think the matchup is in favor of? Uh, anytime Huey's involved, I usually think it's in favor of Huey. Sure, yeah, uh, that's fair. It's, it's kind of like a life philosophy. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's <laughs> reasonable. Well. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, well, Shahar, it's been a real pleasure to have you on the show today. We've got Good one job, match, Shahar. but you're going you. to be chilling. You're going to be watching and... Uh, <laughs> yep. cheering Huey on from the other room there. Um, wow, it, it's been a fun day, and it's good to see Field of the Dead have one last hurrah. Is it good to see that? Maybe not. Is it? Well, we'll see. We're gonna see. <laughs> I think we're going to see some zombies Chad in doesn't minute. think it's good to see that. <laughs> I agree with Chad. But, but, I mean, it was a competitive, you know, a fairness decision rather than, like, a... You know, because again, these players are playing for so much. Uh, you know, we try to convey that here to let everybody know really what's on the line here at MPL Weekly for the MPL players, and it is a lot. So fairness is a huge issue there, even though everybody would have preferred 
to have played these these rounds, you know, with current standard meaning Field of Dead having been banned. It just didn't make sense with the timing right after the Mythic Championship to do it that way. And of course it our wouldn't schedule's have been determined fair. before we know the bans. Yeah. Right. And they didn't know, you know, what was gonna get banned or not. So you couldn't expect players to have prepared, you know, based off off of an assumption or something like that. They so, would basically have to prepare on yeah. their flight. Like, oh, right. well, I got this 10 hour flight, I guess I can't. Yeah, yeah and, and, and some of them had Wi-Fi. longer flights and some of them had shorter yeah. flights and so that you know throws it off. So while it is a little weird to see Field of the Dead, it's worth it because the the fairness and integrity of the tournament is more important. Absolutely, and yeah. these players not uh, making sure they have a fair shot at just two mythic points per match is is so important. Uh, they add up. It yeah. is, yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, um, Shahar, are we going to see you playing some noxious crafts? Coming well, up? I'm not going to say I'm not sure, playing sure, that card. You just said it was reasonable. It, it is absolutely reasonable, <laughs> but I don't know what I'm going to be doing yet. We're going to be uh, testing tomorrow before I need to lock in. So, Rotting well, let me just tell you. Well, sure, sure. sure. That, doesn't, that doesn't die to noxious grass. So. Yeah, see, and it there kills you your opponent. Mm -hmm. Yep. Interesting. All right. Well, we're going to go into our grand finals soon. Right after this break. Welcome back to MPL Weekly. Becca Scott, back with Corey Baumeister hey, and hey. Marshall Sutcliffe. Did you almost forget my name? Never. <laughs> Yours is the one I if always remember. Written. If it wasn't right down there. Oh, it's right down there, yeah. Tonight and I see your lower third. <clears throat> well, we, if you were uh, watching the Name That Card ad break, you saw the card we're going to hopefully be seeing a lot, Noxious Grasp. Get to know that art. It's definitely uh, going to be a good even main deck strategy uh, in the, the new post-Field of the Dead band uh, yeah. world. Well, now Oko's the one with the target on his back. Okay, so let's see what we've seen so far in this week of MPL Weekly. Of course, Autumn Burchette, they have gone straight to the grand finals after beating Huey the first time to send him down to the lower finals there. And now we're almost ready for our grand finals first match. But of course, this is now best of three matches. So we're gonna starting match four of today soon, but we might see five, maybe even six uh, matches. So uh, here's our head to head for Autumn and Huey. Um, obviously, Huey's been playing for quite a while, and top finish just ticked up one more. But they both had great round robin this week with five and two records. Autumn, of course, on Golos Fires, which is uh, no longer legal except for today, <laughs> because uh, these players didn't have much time after Mythic Championship Five. Yeah, this is kind of the last run as well. We'll see if uh, if Golos Fires can finish strong. Yeah. Prove why it needed to be banned, maybe? Yeah, I mean, I feel like we kind of knew yeah, why yeah. it needed to be banned, but also, like, I guess, you know, I mean, if I put myself in Autumn's seat, I'm also like, you're going to let me play the thing. I'll play the thing, right? Sure, like, there's absolutely. There's a reason it was banned. It's excellent. Well, Especially with the experience of playing the deck at the last Mythic Championship. I know I would run that back. And the sure. testing that goes into yeah. the lead up and all that, of yeah. course. They you knew test, it inside and out. Yeah. You test your deck hundreds and hundreds of times, I imagine. Yeah. I mean, you the do. players put a ridiculous amount of hours into one deck. Unless you're Javier, and then you switch to Gruel last minute. Yeah, <laughs> and win. And win everything. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I understand why you go with Goldos Flyers, because the stakes are one of these players is going to get us straight into day two of Mythic Championship 7 in Long Beach in December, which is such a huge deal. It's a huge oh, yeah. deal. Uh, you know, for Autumn, they're already doing fine on the standings in that top eight uh, section and looking pretty good for yeah. MPL and, and a seat at, and already has a seat locked up at the World Championship. But for somebody like William Huey Jensen, you know, he's on that kind of in-between mode where another big finish would just completely lock things up, uh, you know, most likely. Yeah, so, and, and this could be that. I mean, a win, you know, winning this split here could be the difference between staying in the MPL and being on that shaky ground. 100%. I mean, already getting, what, 12 points from six wins and then could possibly get another four here and then automatically catapulted into day two is just insane. I just can't imagine sitting around for the first day of a Mythic Championship. That would be the most relaxing thing yeah. ever. <laughs> and it's crazy because it's hard to translate that, right? Like, you're a pro player, you know what that would feel. You'd be oh, like, yeah. this is absurd. Yeah. And you know, the monetary boost as well as the points and stuff. 
Uh, it's huge for these players. I mean, mm -hmm. Jensen's going to be sitting there playing at his computer. You know, he's got the dog laying next to him, and yeah. he's playing some high-stakes magic here. This isn't yeah. just, you know, a few hundred bucks we're talking about. Absolutely. Crazy. And I think uh, to most effect for Brad Nelson, Mythic mm -hmm. Championship 3 when he went to day two and then finished as the runner-up uh, to... Uh, Never heard of him. Who? <laughs> yeah, that Nexus Oh, yeah, your brother. Again. Right. Oh. I forget. <laughs> I cried when I saw that Nexus come down. <laughs> uh, hard watch, but so fun to watch. It was really, Liberato, really yeah. intense. All right, well, we <laughs> do have this first best of three match. We have the first match ready to go, so let's see that now between All Autumn right. and Pete. Okay. All right, let's get underway here in our first <laughs> best two out of three match. Now, the Whichever player wins is going to have to win two matches to do yeah, so. That, that's, yeah. that's the simplest way to put it. And what do we have here? Well, this has a lot of promise. A it once does. upon a time, maybe find a little Gilded Goose and get things rolling? Maybe. No, it went it away. Decides against it. I mean, that was a turn two mana accelerant plus once upon a time. The problem is that second once upon a time is almost always pretty bad. Yeah, right? it, it, that yeah. was effectively a mulligan uh, on the yeah. once upon a time, and Jensen decided not good enough, but now he's in trouble. Oh. Down to five cards. Cards. Oh, no. Right. Now, we yeah. still could see a turn two Oko out of this draw, though. That's pretty interesting, though, because Huey kept a hand almost exactly like this against Autumn in this first match. Remember where he led on the goose that he found off once upon a time? Decides, that game didn't go so well. I want to try to uh, do a little bit better. Ooh, Brick City here for Jensen, yeah. though. Fires off once upon a time looking for Gilded Goose and instead is forced to take Womp a forest? forest. Yeah. Ugh. I mean, what, what do you want? Redundant uh, questing beast there? Or no. to for sure cast your questing beast? I think that's much more important. Right. Yeah. Of course, questing beast is a legendary creature. Yeah. A little bit of a, a little bit of an interesting hand up top. Yeah, kind of interesting here. He's just going to go uh, land, land. Now passes the turn back to Burchett, who what is Burchett working with? Ugh, nothing much up there either. So very slow start for both players. Yep. A turn three Oko. Normally, you'd think that's pretty darn good, but yeah. there's really nothing to back it up here outside of Questing Beast. So Jensen is going to lean very, very hard on trying to get Burchett dead as quickly as possible here with Beast plus food token next turn attacking. 100%. And I mean, that's a fast clock. Seven damage coming in is uh, not nothing. And something to note that they are two Field of the Deads here. So, you know, we are still a little ways away from actually getting zombies here. And with no land in hand, this will, this will be an interesting next turn. But unfortunately, he was really dependent on this working. Yeah. You know? And, and it seems unlikely to go the distance. Now, this turn's yeah. nice, right? Yeah. Bash you for seven oh, down to yeah. 13. But you see Golos Tireless Pilgrim in hand here for Burchett. Yep. And a circuitous route as well, zombies could start flowing. Zombies can only start flowing, though, uh, of noteworthy here if the circuitous route is played. Golos yeah. doesn't get another Golos no. here. So I, I think I like the play here of playing circuitous route to be able to get the unique lands to trigger field, and then your Golos can either get you know black mana if you don't have that to activate it, or just another field to really start going nuts. That's right. So the circuitous route is going to trigger the fields twice for each, yeah. so four zombies. Yep. And there's the black source to uh, be able to for sure activate Golos. So now there's no liability to have to go get that with Golos, which is definitely relevant. But I'm looking at Autumn's hand, and I, uh, I am really scared for Huey with Agent next turn. Agent is going to be such a big deal. Yeah, it's going to be huge. Able to take that questing beast, yeah. most likely, and start attacking Oko's loyalty as well. You yeah. also see... Autumn taking the very conservative line here of just casting Fey of Wishes. Yeah. They're looking at their hand and going, I've got so much action coming up, I don't need to do anything. So instead, I'm just going to play this thing out as a 1-4 flyer as a redundant blocker yep. against the 3-3. Three, three. Yeah, and what that screams to me is playing around Deputy of Detention. Because mm. if Deputy came down, there's no blocking that would happen. Now Deputy is like not good. It's not even a good play because Fey of Wishes jumps in front of the Elk. You go to nine, and you can recover. All right. So first things first, Questing Beast is going to get in the red zone here and knock Burchett down to nine. But I have a bad feeling for Jensen that that was the last time that Jensen's going to get in for damage <laughs> yeah. this game. For real. Ooh, Faye takes the Faye. That's interesting. Oko's going to switch 
Fae of Wishes for Paradise Druid. Interesting. You know what? What that does on surface value, though, mm -hmm. with Questing Beast and Fae attacking, that turns it into a two turn clock instead mm -hmm. of a three. So that's relevant, but I don't think that's what we're gonna see. I think we're gonna see Agent take Questing Beast, and I don't think anybody has ever won in the history of time when you take a Questing Beast nah, this early. Impossible. It's so devastating. That's right, and Jensen has no good blocks for Questing Beast either, just the 3-3, three, three, which would be a chump block at yep. this point. And if that's the case, then Burchett's just clapping their hands, going, sweet, I got both of them off the battlefield <laughs> yeah. and added a 2-3, uh, I'm in for that. And if Jensen doesn't block, well, he's gonna lose Oko. 100%. Beautiful play here from Autumn Burchett, agent of treachery, just the devastating, it's gonna be a, you know, a three for one here by the end of the day. Yep, and I mean, Questing Beast Vigilance ability, Awesome in normal situations, but right now it's definitely kind of holding Huey back because, well, now it gets to block. Mm -hmm. We could even see the zombies come into the red zone as well. If the yeah. questing beast is gone, it's just the 3-3 three, three back that has like a great block on the zombie. Yeah. And I love the agent of treachery here, just because if combat were to ever happen from Huey's side again, that agent of treachery can get into just block one of these elks, go to the yard, and then you can set up a play where you go like Kenrith, return agent of treachery, and <laughs> easy, right? Yeah, now this is interesting. So Autumn, after tanking it out, has decided to take Oko, Thief of Crowns, and shrink down the questing beast. Interesting. Leaving them with an active planeswalker, but no beast. Interesting. I mean, the, uh, the thing I'd be scared of is another questing beast here from Jensen coming off the top of the library. No but. kidding, yeah. With one card though, they uh, they just assume that that's not insanely likely. Sure. Um, and decides to go with that. Powerful play as well. Well, best card for uh, <laughs> Huey uh, in the sense where he just lost an Oko, at least gets it back. Just gets it right back. Yeah. But at this stage of the game, that Oko just doesn't look yeah. great like it did way back on turn three when he first played it. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. What do you do with this one? See that little gear in the upper right-hand corner? Yeah, would you hit that one? Then there's a little button you can hit in the middle. <laughs> Audio? Not Audio that settings? one, no, not video <laughs> settings either. A little lower, okay, keep, okay. keep scrolling down, okay. you'll get there. <laughs> <laughs> so here's Oko. Now Jensen has made improbable comebacks today. Yeah, oh, that game too with the deputy off the awesome. top of that Wicked Wolves, that was impressive. And then the last game as well, coming from way behind. Yeah. So this is, you know, you never count Jensen out. If there is a way, he will be aware of it and he yeah. will make every play possible to try to get to it. But In yeah. the meantime, <laughs> I think he's not gonna find it this time because of what we know about Autumn's hand, yeah, which Autumn's is that that hand stacked. is stacked oh, up. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm pretty sure with the three cards that remain in Autumn's hand, any one of them would be a game winner. But now they have the option so of all three. So are we casting Beanstalk Giant straight up? This is the fertile side. Oh, uh, okay. Yep. I was gonna say because, you know, we could see Beanstalk Giant Kenrith activate Kenrith GG. Yeah. Like this, this spells out a, an attack for lethal to me. Otherwise, I don't know why you go get that land. No, nope. Kenrith is not gonna be cast, so that's not a, okay. Just wanted that extra land to be able to get a crisis into play I and also so. get some zombies. Sure, and just yeah. set up for next turn. Sure, yeah. I mean, now we're at 13 life if we're sitting in Burchett's seat. Oko going, all the zombies, an 8-8 eight, eight yeah. Hydroid Crisis in the air. And winning next turn seems trivial, given the hand. And look at that little ring around Field of the Dead. Oh. There's not been a land played, so oh. here comes some more zombies. How about three more zombies? <laughs> <laughs> all right. Deciding what to do with Oko from Burchette's side. Oh yeah, upgrade. The big upgrade, <laughs> give your zombie plus one, plus one. And of course, upgrade it to a strictly better creature type. Exactly, yeah. Can you imagine a zombie elk coming at you? Yes. That'd be terrifying. I've thought of this before. Yeah. yeah. You have? We'll talk later. Okay. <laughs> oh. Oh. Elk off the top so you uh... like Oko. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think Huey's just uh, putting the final touches on if there is any way out of this. 
hydrate Krasis into a deputy or something, probably gonna come to the same conclusion that we did, that no, it's gear time. <laughs> and that's gonna be game number one, going to Autumn Burchette. Autumn's and of course, immediately, disdainful <laughs> stroke times four. <laughs> <laughs> he just yeah. snapped all four of them in there, as well as the two copies of Ether Gust. And it looks like he's trimming a deputy, a hydrate Krasis. And a Leafkin Druid. And a Druid. Likely play around Deafening Clarion being that mm. early blowout. He took out all of the Wicked Wolves, it looks like. As yeah, well. that card's really bad in this matchup. I mean, the best thing you can hope for is the fact that you have two foods uh, racked up here, and a Golos is your only target that you can just eat away, but you just have better targets. Oof, duh. Yeah, that's, uh, that's not good enough. I think that is a very good uh, mulligan here. Now, this one has to be a keep, especially if that once upon a time can find a ramp creature. Yeah, exactly. What do you put back, though, Marshall? Like, this is tough. Does it have to be Nissa? Oh, I'm way too greedy to do that. Same. Uh, I need I all of these cards. I think it would be Oko for me, but God, that's tough, right? That's really tough. Because I think Once Upon a Time is that card that has the highest ceiling, right? Like, if you can get a ramp creature and you can get turn three Questing Beast or turn two Oko, it's insane, but yeah. Sad, this... sad times for Jensen here. If he has to put back the Nissa, that's one of his best ways to win yeah, the no game. Kidding. He really just kind of wants to keep everything. Although, Nissa, whenever you have to generate a bunch of 3-3s, three and then you get Deafening Clarion, or Rem Cloak Giant, or Ooh. Time Wipe, it feels really bad. Real bad, real bad, yeah. yeah. You're right, you're right. Ooh. Hey, there's <laughs> a Gilded Goose, though. Can you say turn two Oko and turn baby. three Questing Beast? Hello. That's the business. Now, the question wow. is, what has Autumn brought to the table to combat this? And currently... Nothing. That's pretty slow. That's pretty slow. Teferi here, bouncing a food or bouncing questing beast is not super relevant. No, it's so slow compared to what Jensen's going to be doing. Also, Teferi will not stick on the battlefield long yeah. against questing beast. So, oof, yeah. another land off the top, though, for Burchett. And this one could be over quickly, even with mulligans from Jensen. Yeah. Well... Putting the Oko on the bottom would have definitely been the, the correct play with knowing perfect information of what's on top of your deck because being able to go turn three Questing Beast into turn four Nissa here would have been insane. Indeed. Yeah. But as it turns out, it's just going to be the Beast for now, but still massive pressure. Okay, there's Ooh. a glimmer of hope, though. Yeah. For Autumn, they find Fires of Invention, which... This is the kind of thing that you need to get back, right? Because it's so explosive. The yep. question is, is it still too slow for, at this juncture? I mean, on surface value, all it is right now is just be able to play Securitas Route plus Fires and then set up for something. If you were to draw a Fae of Wishes or something like that. But on surface value, it doesn't actually do anything in the mm -hmm. hand. But, right. but the ceiling on it is so high. Right, and there's yeah. going to be a draw step or two worth of, of action there for Burchett, especially yep. with this Teferi coming down and sending <laughs> Questing Beast back to hand just to slow things down a bit here for Jensen. Yep, 100%. Now, this does allow him to play the Temple Garden untapped, play the Questing Beast, and wake up the food to bash for seven. It's still a very fast clock. Yeah, might even wake up the goose here. Oh, waking yeah. up the goose! Yep, yep. And, and so what this is playing around is a Wrath of God effect, right? Like a Time Wipe here, um, or a Realm Cloak Giant, because then you have that food sitting back that is essentially a haste creature here. It oh! Fae of Wishes oh was my. the draw step. The oh question my. is, will Burchett be alive? Oh, yeah. Because I don't think so. Well, on surface value, or just on the board, uh, Autumn is dead on board, so right. it just has to so be... So they can't go with Circuitous Route, because that doesn't do anything. You have to play of Wishes. You just have to just, play... Just cast it. Yep. Mm -hmm. Nothing else you can do here. Whoops. Yep. <laughs> well... Feels bad, but... But if you can survive a turn with yeah. Fires and get a lucky top deck, things could actually turn around. Yeah. And the thing is, you don't need a lucky top tech. You have mm. Fae of Wishes that you can return to your hand, mm. go get rid of, or, you know, cast the, the granted side, get a time wipe. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Still, that might not be enough against Jensen, who will certainly be planning for that type of thing. Yeah. Similar to what you described last turn, Corey, with leaving the food available. Yeah, well, here's the thing. If Huey doesn't put the food into combat right now, and Huey's gonna put a food into combat here because Questing lethal. Beast. 
because a questing beast is that extra push, all Huey wants to do right now is get Autumn's life total to four or below. So that if whatever combination uh, of stuff happens from Autumn's side, the haste creature is likely to be too much. That's right. Yep. So Jensen can now set up for the following turn victory with the yep. questing beast in hand and almost doesn't have to care about what happens on the battlefield as exactly. much. Exactly. I see, I see. Exactly. This makes sense. Let's see what he comes to as far as a conclusion here. I think if I were Huey, I would put the food um, into play here, uh, create an elk, attack, and then just play another Oko to generate another food. So then you have that haste threat again to just create that next food into a 3-3 plus the questing beast. Yeah, I love these situations from high-level players. When you're really, really far ahead, some players are just like, yep, I just want to play this, play this, I'm so far ahead. Professionals at this high level of, uh, of um, the battlefield here, they slow down. They try to just make sure every single one of their bases is covered, just make sure they don't throw away this uh, advantage that they have right now. All right, so this is going to be seven. Putting Autumn down to two. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see if there's any follow-up. I don't expect a Paradise Druid, but maybe an Oko. So Jensen applying maximum pressure here, getting the double Oko activation, Oko activations this turn by creating yet another passive haste win condition that cannot be swept away. Yep. So you can see him stockpiling his victory here with the questing beast and the food token, both at the ready, regardless of whether this board gets swept. Yep. And at this point, there really isn't a five drop in Autumn's sideboard besides Time Wipe. Time Wipe would be the most effective threat right now. And with even just Oko, on the battlefield, threatening lethal with the food. I think Autumn's just gonna realize that and uh, scoop him up here. Jensen's start was just too quick compared to how slow Burchett's slow yeah. the draw was. And you know what? You know what the difference of this game was? Hmm. Is hitting that Gilded Goose off once upon a time. That was it. That was it. Massive. A turn behind here was not gonna be good for Huey, you know? Right now, he would have just cast, you know, the first questing beast. All right, I like that play. Do you like the scoop too? Yeah, I like the scoop here too. That's, uh, that's a next level play. <laughs> and there we go. So game number game three, three incoming. This is, of course, our best two out of three matches. This is our ah. first match in our grand final. And you know what, uh, something to note here? That's the first game Autumn has lost in this top four. Mm. Yeah. 2-0 well, sweep it, against Huey it, earlier. It took, so. it took Jensen to do it. Yep. <laughs> Looking for that revenge match here. Yeah, it's pretty interesting that there's just not much sideboarding from Autumn's side. It's just all your cards you want to be in the sideboard. It's, it's an interesting deck, to say the least. All right, opening Ooh. hand, and that is a turn to Oko. That's what we call a sneep in the biz. Yeah, that's a, a snap that, key. That's a sneep for sure. <laughs> Yeah, Disdainful Stroke as well, one of the key sideboard cards at the ready to yes. protect the board that Jensen will build out, and that is exactly what he's looking at. Now, I'm hoping to see a quicker start here for Autumn, yep. because they had a very slow start last time, and were really punished by a hand that was really just built around turn two Oko, turn three Beast. I don't know if this is it, Marshall. That's a, I do. That ain't it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a rough one. I mean, no ramp. Only two lands, too, and Autumn's opening hand for last game mm. still needed a fourth land, mm -hmm. you know? Now, this one does have Deafening Clarion, Oof. which can help clean up the mess. Yeah. As well as, yes, Fey of Wishes to kind of act as speed bumps and slow things down from Jensen, so... But Autumn's gonna need to see some lands off the top of the library here to make this work. Oh that's no! That's gotta be the worst top. Deck. Oh no! Oh no! A second circuitous route is not it. You usually, don't need two of those. Yeah, <laughs> that is an understatement. And My I goodness mean, sakes! And if we look at Huey's hand, Huey's hand developed insanely nice, or really nicely. Like getting, he wants upon a time for the beast, and got mystical dispute off the top. So I mean, now Oko next turn followed up by either a threat or holding back a counterspell 
if Huey is afraid of, you know, maybe like a time wipe or something, but with this start here, that's guaranteeing that there's not gonna be a four drop on turn three from Autumn, which is one of the more powerful draws that Golos Fires can, uh, uh, can supply. All right. A red Saurus would be huge. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, a red no. card. Yeah, well, close, I right? blame you for that, Corey. <laughs> okay, okay. I'll and you know it. what? Autumn does, too. Dang it. Sorry, Autumn. That's an unfortunate draw here, and yeah, I think you just have to run out of Faye to stem the bleeding. And now, at this point, Huey is just just understanding the position that he's in. I would be really shocked if Questing Beast doesn't uh, hit the battlefield this So turn. the idea yeah. here is play Questing Beast and then that's your, you have Questing Beast plus Oko, you have plenty enough to build out a board to win, just protect that board with your counters. 100%, yeah. having two counter spells back up with just the clock that Questing Beast and Oko um, supplies, it, it would be, it would be very tough, even if it goes land land from Autumn, to be able to fight through these two counter spells because mm -hmm. they're both just insane against any four drop that uh, Autumn can deploy here. So this is a big turn because no land here and this game's over. Uh, All right. And even that is pretty bad because the one way for Autumn to really get back into this is just prison realming the questing beast, and that stems ah, a lot of damage. Right, but, but a tap land says no. Yeah. I mean there's a lot of them in the deck, right? Like yes, I mean yes. the, the odds of drawing an untap land there, pretty bad, but missing on the third land drop in the first place. Pretty unfortunate when there's so many lands in the deck. Deputy of Detention is the draw step here for Jensen, but he yeah. just needs to now solidify his board, start bashing with beasts and foods and whatever else, yep. and try to get this thing locked up. This would be a big step in the right direction for Jensen, who has had to do it the hard way after that opening round against Autumn, no where kidding. he got slapped right down to the lower bracket, yeah. but has fought his way all the way back. I mean, I think you said it right. I think you said it perfect. Doing it the hard way is for sure having to beat Javier Dominguez when he's just yeah. on fire. Yeah. <laughs> Seriously. I can't think of anything more difficult. Yeah, Autumn with a really solid finish at the Mythic Championship as well. They finished yeah. in 12th. 12th, yeah. Huey, uh, no slouch either. No. Took uh, top eight. That's right. God, it would just be just so kind of draining to immediately play in one of these high stakes tournaments like the MPL Weekly right after you come off, you know, a long weekend at the Mythic Championship. Ooh, that one can actually be countered here. That's interesting. Okay. That's interesting. With uh, playing that Paradise Druid, Prison Realm and Deafening Clarion were uncounterable. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, I mean, this... I guess Huey does have the, the deputy to just deal with Prison Realm here, so... I see. So even if the yeah. Questing Beast gets gobbled up, he really won't have a big setback. 100%. And with the haste ability on Questing Beast, getting that Prison Realm out of there is still huge. But if you're sitting in Burchett's seat, is there a reasonable target besides Questing Beast here for I mean, Prison Realm where you get less punished? I mean, Planeswalkers are similar. Yeah, Planeswalkers have haste too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so. I mean, that's your only choice is that, or if you really send to Deputy, you take food. But I don't think Autumn has the luxury of playing to the more safe option right now. I, I think Autumn just has to be swinging for the fences because they're just so far behind. That's right, yeah. and that's exactly what happens here. So Prison Realm takes care of Questing Beast, if, even if only temporarily. And right now, we do have nine damage that could come back from Huey here, deputing that, and then you can actually do a little switcheroo with the food and the Fae of Wishes here mm -hmm. um, to get that blocker for the 3-3 three, three out of the way. Put Autumn down to three. Yeah. Create anything, any, any elk is lethal, the Questing Beast is lethal. And with a counter spell as a backup plan, yeah. it just feels impossible. But there's no need to do this. It's still a two turn clock by attacking like this. Mm. You know, four damage is coming through, and then you just make another food here and then have another haste threat coming back. It's, uh, this one should be all but locked up. Uh oh. Did we go through blocks there? Oh, I don't think so. Okay, we're blocking now. Right. Yeah. So there's a block there. Four damage, as you mentioned, Corey. Yep. In the red, that is eight. Ooh, 
Oh, oh the and the super <laughs> combo. Yeah, I love that play. Essentially giving it minus one, minus one. Yep. Since it had three damage on it, it did, uh, it did die there. And that's gonna be match one. Wow. wow. Well done for <laughs> William Huey Jensen getting the job done there. Wow. In, uh, in the first match and taking that big step towards victory. Yeah. That was huge. Now, game one is pretty tough for Huey, right? Because yeah. those disdainful strokes are in the sideboard, would you say? Mostly because Wicked Wolf is in the main deck. So it, it, it's almost always just a, four, a hill giant, right? A four out of three, three, that sometimes has some application against time wipe and stuff like that. So that's not nothing, but it's it's not as good as counter spells for sure in this match. Right, right and it's crazy yeah. because it's not only that you get the bad cards out, you get your best card in. It's yep. a huge Huge swing, right? Taking out the bad stuff and replacing it with actively really good stuff, you know, just cha changes the compli the uh, how that matchup goes. Yeah, counter spells are just so powerful against the Fires of Invention deck because you to be a very powerful Fires of Invention deck, you have to be playing a lot of sorcery speed bombs, right? And for that to happen, you got to play it during your turn. You got a disdainful stroke that really puts a wrench in it. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So this first match went to Huey, but this is best of three matches now in the grand finals. So Autumn will need to take this one for us to see a third match. Uh, so we'll see what happens. It's gonna be a battle. Yeah, we're ready for that second match. <laughs> All right, right into it. I match promise. number two underway here. A quick yep. mulligan there once again from Jensen. This one, it's well, okay. it's got the goose that you want to see. The rest is pretty slow. Two expensive cards besides. Yeah, what would you what would you bend here? Marshall. Oh, just one of these lands. Yeah, I think so too. Fabled Passage or something. Yeah. Yeah, I think you have to. The question I'm wondering is, is this a keep? Oh, yeah. And I Going to five, if this was on seven, I think you can make a disciplined mulligan, but on six, you have to keep You just got to keep You it. have to, okay. yeah. Oh my I mean, God, I did the same play as Jensen. Yeah. Yeah, I'm God, a fame good. level player. <laughs> we got there. You're good, man. What about um, for Autumn? They've got a good hand. Yeah, Gross Spiral yeah. into Route into Agent of Treachery is beautiful. This hand compared to the last uh, three hands that Autumn have is just miles better than any other hand here. Being able to go turn three Secutus route and literally turn four Agent to be able to take what is likely gonna either be, you know, a Wicked Wolf or Anissa. That's another card that I don't think I've ever won a game when my opponent takes Anissa on time. No you know? way, no yeah. chance. And you know, <laughs> Autumn's deck can take full advantage too, even with just a forest or two. It's just oh, yeah. stupid. Yeah, there's still some Kraysai on the other side. That's as well. right. Yeah. yeah, and it doubles those and then untaps them. They don't need that much. Yep. To be fair, it's not going to line up perfectly right now because I'm guessing Huey just has to get a Wicked Wolf down. And now we'll see if Autumn is patient enough to wait for this um, for this Nissa. Or deploys it to be, oh, never mind. Now you got a perfect play. Cancel that yep, order. Cancel We've got that. Golos Tireless Pilgrim oh. off the top of the library here for Burchette. Perfect. Oh my god, just the best draw possible. You get a Field of the Dead, and here comes Fabled Passage to create, not one, but two zombies here. Oh my goodness. Of course, one off of the Field of the Dead itself as yeah. well, so Autumn's going to end up with three zombies and Golos. Not too shabby. If. Ooh, like yep, okay, so actually there isn't another basic besides the swamp, island, and forest that is unique. So mm -hmm. it would have only been one. So that's great. Next turn, the Fabled Passage can just get another uh, uh, island, and then it will still trigger twice. So it would have only been one trigger from Fabled Passage this time anyways. Oh, boy. And there's Fae of here Wishes we as well. So now we do get a bit of a fight here, right? Nissa, who shakes the world with double Hydroid Crasis and an, an extra land and two forests on the battlefield. Is that even close to enough? Not even close. Not with this Because he's not going to have it anymore. He's not going to have it. He's only going to have, at best, a Crasis for three. I, yeah, I mean, Agent here taking this. You can actually just grant it as well when you untap and play another land. Come on, <laughs> are you serious? <laughs> this is oh, ridiculous. Yeah, yeah this, uh, this one's gonna be quite tough uh, for Huey to come back from. That was uh, Huey's percentage chance to win the game just dropping off a cliff. Oh yeah. When that Nissa went to the other side of the battlefield. 100%, I guess you need another Nissa off the top and then start gaining huge uh, value off Krasis, but I don't even know if that's enough. 
Right now we got a Fae of Wishes, so no Fire of Invention, though, of Noteworthy, but you can still get Planar Celebration, Shared Summons. You know, you can't get something like Nicol Bolas, um, you know, Casualties uh -oh. of Wars. Casualties. Oh, yeah, I guess you do have two uh, Black Sources in play. That'll do. Does Autumn have two Black... Oh, wow, yep, okay, yep. That okay. that was an Azorius Guildgate in a swamp there. Which Guildgate? Uh, Zorius. The black white one, right? That is Orzov. Orzov, yeah. But I think me. that is an Orzov. Yeah. yeah, I do see what you're pointing at there. Yeah, yeah. Huh. These guilds are tough. Yeah, man. <laughs> Casualties of war. Yeah, you usually don't see it without a fires of invention, but the mana base of uh, Autumn's uh, Golos deck just can really cast anything besides Nicobolus. The three black of Nicobolus is a little tough. Yeah, this game is over. Jensen oh, is Cameron. now in desperation mode. He just had to cast a crisis for the most awkward amount, three. <laughs> yeah. I, don't, I think one's a little worse, though, Marshall. Yeah, but nobody does that. <laughs> That's true. And Come if you on. do, you're going to die in two turns. Yeah, you're done sure. anyway. That is your chump block going to live for exactly one turn. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, now Autumn is counting if I just win right now with Kenrith or um, if Casualty of Wars will just shut the door on Huey here. Because you can take out the land, which is the 3-3 three, three island. Yes. The creature, which is the Wicked Wolf. Mm -hmm. And a land. Bec oh, wait, no, never mind. Yeah, you get the land and a Wicked Wolf, though. I think that's plenty enough. Yeah, that seems pretty decent. Yeah. Ooh. Activate Golos. I feel it's a little riskier, but... Spin the wheel? Yeah. I think, I think Autumn just uh, could have closed their eyes and clicked buttons and yeah. probably took this game down. Yeah. That agent on Nissa is just insane. Now we're going to see Circuitous Route into another one. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> we got enough lands? Whee! <laughs> well. Hello. <laughs> Ooh, and I'm mistaken. There was a mountain, so that Fabled Passage play before could have happened. Autumn just chose to get more value um, mm -hmm. by not using the Fabled Passage yet, which is actually really smart, because if a deputy were to come down, you restock with Fabled Passage a little bit better. Yeah, cast the Fae of Wishes. Why not? Another zombie, sure. I feel like Field of the Dead might be a little too strong for standard, though. I mean, can we can we talk about starting to ban this card? Yeah, we should probably get some red flags up. That's yeah. eight zombies on the battlefield now. You got some pole around here, right? You can uh, not really. Oh, okay. You'd okay. think so. I'll talk to Becca about that. Yeah, yeah. talk to her. Like she's she's, uh, she's, she's really the one who pulls the strings. She knows what's up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, couple lands getting busy here. Of noteworthy, not getting busy with Gol. <clears throat> Never mind. <laughs> I was gonna say wanted to. I don't want to protect Golos, but nah. just realizing I'm so far ahead. Gonna happily take the trade with Wicked Wolf here. Oh yeah, I, I love this because Golos goes to the yard. Kenra's ability brings that back. Mm. You're right. You're <laughs> Bring right. Bring it back. Another field haste. <sighs> Crunch. Yeah, and I think that that's exactly what William Huey Jensen was seeing yep. as well. And he's going to go ahead and scoop up game number one. How quickly yeah. does he get those sustainful strokes in? They are in! <laughs> I think his record, I think it was a little faster last time. You're if right. We're going to critique his. Uh, You're right. We can't critique his play because he's so good, mm -hmm. but I mean, if we can critique something, at that least, was, at least yeah. we got the speed of that. Very quick sideboarding <laughs> there from William. So I'd be curious to see exactly how Autumn sideboards, if anything. Like, I guess we did see Teferi's, right? So Teferi's uh -huh. for sure came in. Turn three Nissa good? Ooh, hello. <laughs> we'll yep. see, we'll see. That's that's what I say. Yep, yep. I mean, right after you go turn three Nissa, if Autumn's, you know, able to deploy like Deafening Clarion, clean up these geese as, as well as the land, you know, that does put you really far behind. Yeah, it's kind of interesting because the once upon a time, you know, you'd like to see something like a Questing Beast or whatever, but, you know, with the fact that these are both Gilded Geese, it's kind of like pick the one thing you want to hit early, right? And yep. generally, you want to pick Nissa. Yep. And it looks like that's what Jensen wants here, too. He wants to go Goose, Goose, Nissa, Krasis, do I win? I would have been really curious if, uh, oh, I guess once upon a time, uh, if, if he top decks Oko, I was just going to say, if he top decks Oko, I'm very curious. If he goes for Oko and settles with the turn four uh, Nissa, or just goes Goose, Temple Garden tapped. Yeah. I no, mean, he wants the Nissa on yeah. turn three. He, I think, he yeah. equates that to an extremely high win condition, uh, win percentage, yeah. and he knows 
that Burchett doesn't have really any way to interact. Yeah, and up noteworthy, Otto Burchett's top deck there was excellent. Getting Fabled Passage, Otto didn't have blue for yeah. Gross Fire, so that was huge. Otto's hand is good enough to be able to deal with this turn three Nissa. That's right. Next turn, Fires of Invention, and granted is likely what we're going to see from Burchett. Mm-hmm. So Huey's going to have to make hay while the sun's shining, and that's while Nissa's on the battlefield and on his side of the battlefield. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> that was such a good draw from Huey. That granted is not going to work out too well. Wow. Yeah. Mystical dispute. Animate that hollowed fountain. Yes, I wonder, please. I, I wonder, you know, if you're sitting in, in Burchett's seat, if you're... Oh. Oh. What? Interesting. So he doesn't want to telegraph the mystical dispute here? So I, I think that is... Uh, that's an interesting line because now not only is your forest not going to be able to do double duty mm -hmm. with uh, Hydroid Crisis here, I mean, you can still use Temple Garden for that, but it, it really feels like uh, you wanted the Hollowed Fountain to be your first target just because it produces less mana with Hydroid Crisis as well as can stop this uh, play here. But, you know... Huey is probably playing around the fact that if Deafening Clarion were to come down, I wouldn't have blue mana. Mm. That, that's probably, and yeah, I mean, that's exactly what happened. Huey's just too good. Huey's too good. That's exactly what happens here. We see Deafening Clarion sweep away the Gilded Geese and the land. We should get him in the Hall of Fame. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, now that Hall of Fountain was a great draw, but we're not really going to see a giant crisis right now. I would, uh, if I was in Huey's seat, I think I would deploy an Oko, um, untap Temple Garden, make a food, play Hollowed Fountain, then you have Mystical Dispute open with three mana, so you can counter Fires of Invention, while still generating the value to create a food, attack with that food next turn, plus still getting a damage. That seems pretty good here, right? Yeah, that it's does a, seem pretty solid. The question's, of course, you know, revolving around what it is that Autumn wants to do with their turn. Fires of Invention sitting there, kind of looming over this board there for Autumn. Another interesting line there, because now this is only two mana, um, but Huey also took two damage for Hollowed Fountain, maybe to represent Disdainful Stroke. Sure. Yeah, because this telegraphing like it's Stroke, like why, or Sacrifice of Food, which you're never gonna do at this stage of the game. Right, so it's Stroke. Yeah. So maybe puts the fear into Autumn a little bit, maybe to not just go land Golos, you know, something that would normally be a very strong play. Still, with Fires of Invention on the battlefield, Autumn's plays are more limited than normal. Yeah. When you can do them and how many you can do them kind of forces your hand. You can't just sit there and be like, yeah, go ahead. I just won't do anything for the rest of the game. You just got to kind of run stuff out until... Until something sticks. Something happens, yeah. yeah. Okay. I love this play from Autumn. Instead of going for Fae of Wishes, try to play something powerful from your sideboard, we're gonna see Grow Spiral, Crisis for four, then, okay, if you have a Disdainful Stroke, counter that, that's not a good target. Right, Yeah. the trigger from Hydra Crisis will go on the stack regardless of whether the card gets countered or not. Yep, and- I love this play yeah, from this Autumn. Is, this is phenomenal, because now, Huey still feels priced in to counter this because a 4-4 body, Shuts down Nissa and Oko quite effectively. And what are you going to do? Oko it? Right. <laughs> and you got a 7 Now you, know? you got a bigger creature. That's yeah. right. But the good news from Jensen's perspective is he does get to untap with the two powerful Planeswalkers here, and he can start putting some pretty serious heat on the life total yeah. of Autumn. Yeah, Still but no way to defend himself anymore. No more counters in hand. I think what we're going to see here, which is just going to be insane, is I, I feel like Huey's priced in to draw some cards with Crisis. So... Uh, maybe not. Maybe Deputy uh, to Fires of Invention is going to be the way to do it here. And with having perfect uh, uh, information like we do right now, that's that would be the better play. Because if Huey just goes for the Crisis and you know activates both Planeswalkers, Autumn can just go Granted for Planar Cleansing and just take everything ooh, out. Ooh, ooh. Yeah, that's scary. And now, of noteworthy, it would be non-lands, you know, so some lands would stick around, but all the Planeswalkers would go, um, and Huey would be left with just really reliant on the two lands uh, to finish the job here. Yeah, very high risk. Yep. 
But Jensen's not in a great position and also does not have the information that you and I have, Corey. So yeah. really tough spot here for Jensen to try to sort out the best way to move forward with this game. And you can see he's taking his time in doing so. Mm -hmm. It's a tough one. Looking like uh, going to err on the more defensive side. Just realizing that all Autumn has to have is one of the four Fae of Wishes, and then that play is going to be devastating. Right. Like right now, if you look at the mana base from Autumn, that's not casting Casualties of War for a long time. Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> a really long time. A really long time. <laughs> All right, so it looks like Oko is going to get maximally aggressive. Okay. Yeah, so make a 6-6 six, six land out of, out of, make it into an elk as well. Yep. So this is maximal damage, nine damage coming across. Mm -hmm. Kind of contained on two cards here before passing the turn, and there's a Golos. There's a Golos. So maximum damage with leaving a haste threat back. Yes. By by animating the hollowed fountain instead of making a food with Oko, some people will be like, well, why would you do that? You're leaving a food back so that now next turn, no matter what, you got three damage. Um, a wrath effect is already quite devastating here, so I don't know if it would truly matter, but it's definitely the cleaner play. Yeah, it's tough too from Huey's perspective because you're looking at Autumn's life total at seven and really wishing it was six. Yeah. <laughs> because then you could just go, my last land, my last food token, send them into the red zone and clean up this mess. But yep. if that doesn't end up working, and it's honestly, a big problem letting Autumn have another untap and draw and all that. 100%. And I think that's why Huey went away from playing the Hydroid Crisis because that was just deploying another threat where no matter what, Seven is the lowest that Huey could get Autumn to. So that's just kind of putting all your eggs in one basket here. So it looks like we're probably going to see Teferi here bouncing Deputy to unlock fires. But is that good? Run out Golos or set up Fae of Wishes for something next turn? Yeah, because, I mean, it, it just has to at this point because... You play a fave which is as a chump blocker here, but that's not even enough. You turn the food into a 3-3, you animate the last land, nine points is getting through. So at this point, oh. it has to be a bounce deputy and hope for something really good. I guess you can bounce the giant hollowed fountain as well. And that's a line that keeps you alive if you play fave of Wishes as the as creature. As the blocker, because yeah. otherwise there will be seven damage coming across the red zone easily. Mm -hmm. It'll be ten, actually. Yeah. And so no, wait, that's, that's actually lethal. not enough, is it? That's still weak. This has to be a top deck, otherwise this is... No, and that's not seven uniques. There's two islands. One, two, three, four, five. The two islands stops this from happening, and game, game two is going to go to Huey unless he, I don't... Trips or something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Because we're, of course, counting the food token being animated and the temple garden being animated and mm -hmm. everything coming into the red zone. Fae of Wishes soaks up three of that damage, but it's three, six, and one. That's seven. The perfect amount. The perfect. <laughs> this is what you guys brought me in for, right? The expert analysis That's of right. uh, counting to seven. That's right. <laughs> and it's brutal because, I mean, there was some draws from Autumn, you know, like a gain life land. Uh, you know, Thornwood Falls or something would have been nice. Oh, you know, that would have been right. insane. All right. So multiple ways to get this done here. Um, and we don't have Vale of Summers, anything that could punish Huey here. So he was just essentially picking the way to win here. Sure. Yeah. And he decides to take the way that gets Autumn from 7-0. to zero. Yeah. So that is game number two in the books for William Huey Jensen. And we're going to see... A game three decider. And this is this is it, right? If Huey yes. takes this down. It's over. It's over. That's right. Wow. Autumn's Lots of pressure on both players here. Huey to try to finish it up because he'd love to not have to play a third match against a tough opponent here. Yeah. And of course, Autumn Burchett fighting for their tournament life. And uh, if it were to go to a third match, is it still random diver, right? Yeah. It, it's not uh, Autumn yeah. gets to automatically go first? Okay. Go, That's go. correct, yep. Yeah. Okay, well, Huey's hand is great. You know, Huey's hand, the first time that these two faced off, his hands were 
really bad. Yep. Really bad. And yep. every draw where he needed a land, it was a Gilded Goose. Or it was a, a piece of disruption or something like that. That's not the case for these matches so far. Huey's ha has had some pretty great hands, even through a couple mulligans. There's that falls that uh, needs yeah. to be a little yeah. bit sooner. Yeah, one turn oh, too late. Oh, my Look at this. Wow, and this off the top. This is just going to find a land, but that seems just fine from Jensen's perspective. That's because not he... even what I'm saying. Look at us. Look at Autumn's hand. What? Autumn had to mulligan. Oh, no. And it is. Oh, that's a disaster. It's not great. Some hands are really awkward because you have to play all these lands that don't necessarily flow. And, I mean, you see a swamp here with time wipe, and you don't see white. You don't okay. see fires. Yeah. Favorite passage is definitely something to help here. Probably the Best draw there yeah. was that growth spiral, but yep. still, that hand is a disaster. Yeah. And Jensen could be on the verge here. If he can finish things off, mm -hmm. he's got Questing Beast maybe into Nissa Who Shakes the World? And Nissa Who Shakes the World with a very key card, mm. Breeding Pool. Ah. Being able to untap the Breeding Pool and have Disdainful Stroke back up so that when you commit your best threat, Boom, you got interaction as well. So we're just going to see Nissa next turn oh, then. Sure, just skip yeah. over the questing beast, and we'll get to that later. Yeah, for sure. I think you have to grant it here. Go get a white source. And then hope that time wipe is enough, even though Jensen is going to very clearly see what's going on and just keep that disdainful stroke at the ready. And it's uncastable right now. It right. doesn't have double white. Yeah, this is really tough draw here for Autumn. And just the stone cold nuts from Huey right now. This, right. This is the best draw that this deck can produce. Yep. Turn three Nissa into, you know, there's only four breeding pools. So getting one of those breeding pools, being able to pair it with Disdainful Stroke and Nissa is just, it's the dream. It's devastating. It's and, the dream. and on top of it, you get to attack. Like, <laughs> yeah. you're also applying pressure here and really forcing the issue on. Autumn's life total, a second copy yeah. of Circuitous Root is not it. And a very disciplined play to not uh, play Paradise Druid there. Um, and that is going to shut off double white. And oh, another and another stroke. disdainful oh, stroke God. for Jensen. He used that first one to shut off Circuitous Root here to keep the board clear. And it was immediately rewarded by drawing a second one. Now he gets to come in for 4, 7, 10, 12 damage and keep up the stroke. Wow. Yeah, Autumn just... Autumn, their draws just did not line up here. Huey just drew perfect. And I mean, I think the, the last question to ask now is, what do you think he's gonna do on Friday on Mythic Championship 7? <laughs> <laughs> Cause we know one thing, he's not gonna be playing his matches cause he's magic. gonna be sitting in the green room Maybe have a little snack, a little yeah. sip of water back there. It's be watch some with of you. them. Yeah. yeah, maybe come by and check on <laughs> old Marshall and see what's up. Yeah, wow. wow. And and this was truly a disaster here yep. for Burchett because of what you said. Not only did their draw stumble and not look great, Huey had the nuts. Yeah, and in the face of Mulligans, you know, Autumn just really did not have the great draws. Um, Huey didn't have the great draws in the first time they met. Um, they had like one great match there, but that last match was definitely decided by Huey just having it all. Had it all and got oh, yeah. the job done. Congratulations wow. to William Huey Jensen. Yeah, he is your Ruby winner. Ruby winner. Big congrats to Huey. Now, Marshall, one mm. thing I want to hear about from you, what's this nightmare of a zombie elk you <laughs> That's the main thing you need to... <laughs> hey, we don't have to get to the important issues. <laughs> I had a nightmare of a zombie elk. Okay, cool, 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 cool. Was it's it, was still it in my first? head, and now that you've brought it to the front, there's like, I'm starting to tear up a It'll little okay. bit. Okay, I, my hands are shaking. Was it a zombie first? His name was Elmer. Ooh. He had died and came back. It's a long story. Was Got it, it your elk? He was my elk at oh, one point. Oh, see, now it's and losing a put it down. Yeah, that's hard. All right. Thanks well, for bringing it up, though, Becca. Wow. Appreciate it. Wow, we'll give Becca. Marshall a minute to compose himself <laughs> as we hear from Huey and how it feels to take home Ruby. I am here with the winner of the Ruby division. Congratulations, Huey. Thank you. That's about as excited as you'll ever see me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Can confirm. Can confirm. I've uh, I worked, I worked with you for a bit. So, uh, uh, okay. So... Just talking about those two matches, I mean, both game ones, Autumn just kind of came out swinging, just had the the perfect ramp draw, and just and just kind of crushed you. Like th those cyborg cards seem to have played a massive uh, role in kind of swinging the the matchup around. For sure, when 
the Golos deck, either deck, is on the play. I mean, I think in one of the games, they went turn two Grow Spiral into turn three Fires Clary in your board. Like, that's it. <laughs> like, I can, yeah. almo- I can almost stack my deck and not win a game one. I don't have enough cards that do anything. Like, my best draws try to get a really fast lead with three power creatures, three, three creatures, and lands that turn into three threes. Like, if they're on the play and before I get a third turn, like my best draw is to put this in the play on the third turn. If they've swept the board before that and they have their key cards in play, it's over, which that's the cost of doing business. You just lose those games, especially on the draw, but that's okay. Um, it's true what you said. I mean, part of the advantage of the Golos Fires deck, from my perspective, I think if I had played... Uh, Golos, either at the MC or here, I would have opted for the Fires version um, because I think it's just a more powerful deck and it goes over the top of normal Golos. But the drawback is you don't get a sideboard. I mean, you can maybe sneak three cards in, like, you know, a couple Agents of Treachery or and one more card. But, you know, other people, you've got a target on your back. So, you know, the Counterspells, they came up big. Even the threat of Counterspells came up big. Um, And... uh, you know, that's the beauty of actually having a sideboard. Now, I'm not saying Autumn made any sort of mistake picking their deck. I think it's a great deck. Uh, but, you know, Fey of Wishes comes at a cost. The, the, the versatility, the flexibility comes at a big cost, and that is that you don't get a sideboard. Yeah, and, and on top of that, I mean, you, you talked about it before too, you know, uh, the deck is capable of some clunky starts, right? If you, if you don't have the right uh, mix of ramp spells, I mean... Taking that turn off even to just cast the wish portion if you don't draw Fires of Invention, I mean, that, that's big. Yeah, and what I've found, I played that matchup a lot. Granted, I was playing Simic at the time, but I played that matchup a lot. I really liked Golos Fires, and I really like uh, tinkered with the card Fires of Invention, though I didn't find anything better than Golos Fires for it. But um, the counter spells against the Golos Fires deck, I found always to be more impactful because sometimes you keep a hand that just goes like, well, I'm going to put this fires into play with like effectively four mountains, you know, like a mountain, a lake of the dead, a Boros guild gate and a whatever, you know, some, some like an Orzov guild gate. And then I'm just going to cast all my spells for free. And like when that fires and those hands get countered, the game ends, you just can't cast spells anymore. So that's another uh, sort of, game one powerhouse strategy, but it falls a little bit tougher if people, it falls a little bit behind if people are fighting your fires with counter spells. Yeah, and I don't think you could have asked for kind of a better sequence of draws uh, when you look at that last game that you had. I was like, I saw that opener and I was just like, wow. Autumn and I were having a conversation afterward. (laughs) um, And I told them, I was like, yeah. I mean, the last game was stupid. I kept my turn three Nissa and then I just only drew disdainful strokes (laughs) at the top. (laughs) Right. Also having a specifically breeding pool as the turn yeah. three land to yeah. untap with Nissa giving you access to that disdainful stroke. Yeah. Huge. And then it's just like, okay, like this time I had the perfect draw. Um, and I think in those spots, you know, if I have a perfect draw, they can still win that game. They have to have an absolutely exactly card for card perfect draw. But if they don't, my draw is basically too good to lose, I think. With the, if, if I draw two disdainful strokes on like turns four and five or whatever. I had one when I played the Nissa on turn three, but... Like, they just have to tap out every turn just to get through them, so. So now, I mean, th- these last couple of events, I mean, you're you're basically, you're kind of on fire now, or heating up, I <laughs> heating guess. Heating up, yeah. Two, two good events, one more, and you're on fire. Yeah. But you have the top eight, and now you've you've won your split, putting in really good position, um, for, you know, for Mythic Championship 7, of course, and then we also have six coming up, uh, you know. I think you, you, at least to start the season, you had just kind of maybe like a middling start. But with these last two, you're now looking to be in very good position to make it maybe back into the MPL next year. Yeah, honestly, I woke up today and sort of that is what was on my mind. Like I wanted to win my split, but the reason I wanted to win it was not necessarily to make day two. Like I want to make day two, but what I want is to get the extra points from making day two to be in the MPL next year. In fact, like I'm going to be honest, I didn't play well at all in my first match this morning. Like, I I got really frustrated after the match with myself. I mean, I know I'm allowed to make mistakes, but the kind of mistakes I made, I was just like, just like loss of focus mistakes, which it's okay to make a miscalculation. That happens, but you got to pay attention, buddy. You know what I mean? And so I don't know if if it's because I was, you know, I, I really would like to be in the MPL next year. So um, I put a lot of pressure on myself to succeed. And uh, so I'm very happy that, you know, this, I was something like 15th after the MC, although it's it's tricky because some people haven't played their splits yet, so it's hard to evaluate. But 
I mean, this is a 24 points maybe for day two. Um, everybody gets 11. So another 13 that I'm sort of guaranteed to jump some people. Um, so yeah, I'm really happy. And I think I have a really good shot now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, now I, I know, you know, you still probably have to spike, but is there any, any, uh, you know, semblance of you shooting for maybe, maybe sneaking in for one of those world spots? Well, given that I get a free roll into a free ride, I guess, into day two of mythic championship seven, I think definitely like winning that is, is the best chance I have right now. Um, I would love to play Worlds again. That was <laughs> when I won Worlds. It was the most fun tournament I ever played. But no, it, it really was the most fun tournament I ever played. Um, both times, in fact. Um, and I would love to play it again someday. Uh, but all these people, uh, all these MPL players, and even the challengers are really good. And, and um, people are getting better and better. So I don't know. I'm going to try, but we'll see what happens. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you had you had an epic epic match against Javier Dominguez, who was also in the top four uh, in that World Championship Finals, if I recall. Yep, for sure. I mean, that was, I think, I've watched that match a lot, like reliving past glory, but <laughs> yeah, that was one of my favorite matches of all time. I think Javier is probably like, you know, definitely one of the handful of best players in the world right now, like no worse than, you know, fourth, maybe first, and uh, one of my favorite opponents. So I was happy to get a win over him today too, because he, he's a tough, he's a tough one. All right. Well, Huey, uh, again, awesome, awesome finish. Uh, I know you're super excited about this. And uh, yet now you're putting yourself in a really good position. So uh, congratulations on winning the Ruby Division. Thanks, Paul. Wow. He, he was, was stoked. He's he was. such a genuine guy. He gave and us the big flex and then the yeah. two thumbs. And it's a great <laughs> reminder of what a big deal these mythic points are and how much it means to these players to stay in the MPL. Yeah, what were you great thinking, point. Corey? I've been testing with him, you know, for the last like two or three years, and I've literally never seen that big of a smile on his face. Even when I watched back him winning worlds, he was just like, nice, I'll take this check, you know? <laughs> that was nice to see. Well, well deserved too. Huey is just. A sicko. Uh, yeah. A real sicko. <laughs> a real sicko. Right. Let's yeah. look at the bracket just to see all the fun stuff we've seen today. Lots of great matches. You can see how Jensen already played for Chet in the first match, which he gave himself a pretty rough pep talk after. <laughs> it's too early. Wake up, man. And uh, and then, of course, Dominguez moving on to the lower finals there. We saw Jensen take him down. And then uh, two matches. Of course, game one being super hard in that matchup yeah. without those disdainful strokes in your main. What do you guys think uh, if Huey could do it again? Do you think he'd still leave the disdainful stroke in the sideboard? knowing that he had to uh, beat Javier. No, I, I think if he could have looked at the bracket, he would have snapped taken the disdainful strokes because sure. he knew he was going to play against Autumn minimum one time. And you just have to take what you can get in the matchup that you know you're going to play for sure and yeah. then make the rest work. As it turned out, he had to play against them three matches. <laughs> yeah. And of course he would have been like, can I have eight disdainful strokes? 100%, because they have applications even against, you know, in the mirror, you know, being able to hit questing beast and this yeah. or whatever. It's They're not just blank. a great card. Yeah, yeah, definitely not a blank. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Well, congratulations again to Huey, who's going straight into day two at Mythic Championship 7. He'll be there with Piotr Kulgowski, who won his division. And then we've got two more players that we're going to find out about in the next three weeks because we're taking a little break as the you guys are at MC in uh, Six in Richmond. Richmond. Yeah, yeah. Six, Richmond, yeah. Tabletop. Six Richmond. Yeah. Tabletop MC. That's November 8th to 10th. And uh, I'm sure we'll have coverage right here on this Twitch channel of that. Yep. And, it's going to uh, be fun. But yep. next Saturday, we've got Pearl Division of MPL Weekly. So, Corey, it was wonderful to have you here. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much for having me. This was, uh, I honestly had the time of my life here. I, I had such a blast. We're Great job, Corey. Nice Thanks. 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 Yeah. You're just fine. He's a natural. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you, Becca. Oh, I'm just fine. I can see that the <laughs> chemistry translates from me watching you two at home to uh, being right between you. Yeah. They actually good. made well, me good. sit between yeah. you to keep. You two apart. <laughs> it's trouble. It's trouble right there. And thanks to Shahar, who's backstage. We'll see you in a second, buddy. All right. Well, thanks so much to you guys for watching as well. We'll see you on future episodes. We have Kale Weekly. Bye bye. Yeah.